Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. Oh, of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Won't you join me in the exploration of the rich resources of your own imagination? Modern science tells us we live in a world of waves. Beyond the atom, the electron, the ion, substance itself breaks down into waves. My voice is coming to you now on waves. And uh, that, as they say, is the long and short of it. But what about thoughts? Might not they comprise wave patterns, too? Patterns that linger on after the thinkers are dead and buried. Might not that explain the empty footfall in the vacant house, the rattle of chains, now rusted and broken, and even the sound of voices long ago silenced? They'll overtake me! They'll put me in irons! And this time, they'll hang me. No, my dear, no. They can't harm you now. They're all gone. They're all turned to dust long ago. They'd be after me. You'd not want to see me swinging in the wind, would you? No, I wouldn't want to see that. I must have a swift, able ship. In mercy's name, help me. Help me. <laughs> mystery drama, The Strange Voyage of the Lady D, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Mary Jane Higby and stars Paul Hecht and Augusta Dabney. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines, and Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The curious adventure that befell the Stevens family would never have happened if Ellen had had her way. But Ellen was a realist, her husband Richard a romantic. And when did realism ever hold the line against the subtle persuasions of romance? It all began during a visit to one of those cruise-ridden, sun-drenched islands in the Caribbean. A friendly family disagreement was in progress, an old story. 
It's been going on now for six years. It's the one at the end of the dock, Ellen. There. Isn't she beautiful? Mm-hmm. It's very nice. But you promised her, Richard, no more boats. Well, not until Susie's at least 16 years old. We'll never see a buy like this again. They're practically giving it away. Well, then there's something wrong with it. It's got dry rot. Not this ship. Come on, step aboard, Ellen. Richard, why do you start these things? You know we're not in the market for a boat. Oh, but this is such a jewel. <sighs> Wait till you see the cabin. Plenty of headroom. A beautiful galley. Can I go, boy? Can I? I want to see. Oh, all right. But just one quick look. And be careful of your dress, Susie. <laughs> Here, let me help you, Susie. Uh, there you are. Now, just look at this after deck. She's all white oak and cedar. And she's a motor sailor. You know, a lot better than an auxiliary engine. You can run just as well under power as under sail. There are two 50-gallon fuel tanks below deck. Mama, look at this kitchen down here. There's even an oven. Really? Is there an oven? <laughs> of course. The ship is a real home. Ellen. What do you say? We take a short run. I have the ignition key. The guy in the boatyard office said I could take her out. No, Richard, I've had it with boats. And anyway, the question's academic. Even if we bought it, we couldn't get it back to the States. We could sail it. Are you out of your mind? It's hundreds of miles. She has an enormous cruising oh. range. What with the engine and sail, we just watch the weather predictions very carefully. Well, come on, no. Susie. We're going to get off now. Richard, you take the keys back to the boatyard man. And I'll get the car and bring it down as far as I can. I'll pick you up at the gate. Daddy? Yeah? I want to take a ride in it. Can I tomorrow, Daddy? Can I? Oh, can I? Huh? What, dear? Can we go both for a boat ride tomorrow? I don't know. Depends on your mother. Oh, I wish we could buy the boat. Don't you? Daddy? Don't you? Don't I watch? Wish we could buy the boat? Yeah. Well, that part's all taken care of. I already bought it. The only problem now is how to break the news to your mother. Now, Ellen, you have to admit, this is the life. Look at that sea. It's like glass. It's too calm. I don't like the gray mistiness that's settling over everything. I won't feel good until we sight land again. I won't be long now. We were clipping right along when we had the sails up. See, that's the advantage of a motor sailor. When the wind died, we could switch right over to power and still maintain our speed. Except for that panicky half hour when you couldn't get the engine started. Ah, just a little corrosion around the points. A bit of sandpaper fixed that. Here, Ellen, why don't you take over the wheel, huh? I want to go and look at the chart. Now, the first buoy we pick up is number 12. From there, we'll see a light. If we make it before nightfall, you can take over for a few minutes. Okay, Susie? I don't like this mist. Uh, uh, you know where we are right now? We are sailing on the Spanish main. The Spanish main? That's right. These waters were infested with pirates in the old days. Blackbeard and Calico Jack. Richard, I think there's a fog closing in. Look ahead. Yeah. Well, just hold a steady course. We'll be sighting that buoy any minute now. Uh, Susie, go below and bring up my binoculars as a good girl. The visibility's not any too good. Uh, we can't be far from port. Oh, Richard, I hope we're not running into one of those awful pea soups. Now, don't panic. Don't get Susie frightened. Here's binoculars. Thanks. Can you make out anything? No, well, I don't see it yet. But we will. Tell me more about the pirate. <laughs> okay. Well, Calico Jack Rackham... They called him that because of the fancy clothes he wore. He sailed with Anne Bonny. They were girl pirates, too, you know. Girl pirates? Sure. Anne Bonny and Harry Reed. And from all accounts, they were better at it than the men. The fog's getting awfully sick, Richard. I've never seen one roll in so fast and the sun's gone. Uh, I'll take over. No, I can hold her on course. You keep looking for that buoy. We should have been in port long ago. Well, we lost a little time trying to start the engine. Are we lost? Of course not. I think we ought to start sounding our foghorn. Not yet. Don't you want to hear what happened to Anne Bonnie? What happened to her? Well, the pirates all went to jail. They hanged poor old Calico Jack. Mary Reed was dying of a fever, and Anne Bonnie nursed her. And then, well, nobody knows just what did happen. 
In the morning, when the jailkeeper opened their cell, he found the body of Mary Reed, but Anne Bonney was gone. She disappeared and was never heard of. Richard! What? Look! Look what you've done, oh, Richard. How could you? Well, what? Well, what is it? This monkey wrench. It's right behind the compass. Richard. Who put that there? Who? Who was working on the engine? That wrench will have pulled that compass so far out of line. Heaven knows where we are now. Sorry. I was so glad to get that motor started. Oh, Oh, Elena, I'm sorry. Oh. If I ever get my feet on dry land now, again. Now, look, let's keep calm. We are not lost. Oh, no. We're still right here in the Atlantic Ocean. I'm oh, sorry, Ellen. How I ever let you talk me into this expedition. Now, just just try to keep cool. Daddy? It's all my fault. We're probably 50 miles off course. Daddy, there's a big can floating over there. What? Uh, where? There. The boy. It is. Oh, thank heaven. I'll take the wheel. I want to go right up to it. we got to be sure of that number. It should be, be 12, right? I see it. I see the number. What is it? Three. Three? No, it can't be. A three and an eight. Oh, no. That's what it is. Ellen? Susie's right. 38. That, that, that's impossible. Take the wheel again, Al. Just idle here by the buoy. There's no 38 on this chart. We're way off course. I have to go below and get the other charts. Can you still see the buoy, Susie? Sure. It's right here. Well, keep your eye on it. Don't let me drift too far away. Darling? Yeah? You're not smoking down there, are you? (laughs) Good Lord, no. You know, I haven't smoked in ten years. I smell tobacco. So do I. What? Well, let me get at the engine. Maybe there's a short in the wire. No, no, it's not like that. It's... It's tobacco. (laughs) Did you hear that? What? It sounded like... Somebody laughed. Ahoy! It's a ship. Where? I don't see anything. Ahoy! Ahoy! You don't answer. Blow the horn. Ahoy! What ship are you? The Lady D. We're off course. Can you give us our bearings? You'd best lay over for the night. Steer north by east. A quarter east. You'll run right down the channel. Thank you. I still can't see anything. North by east. A quarter east. It was a woman. Bring the ship around. Slowly, Ellen. That's right. I hope she knows what she's talking about. And I still smell tobacco. So do I. Was she that close? Funny. I didn't see a thing. I didn't hear any motor. Maybe she's sailing. Now, Susie, how could she be? There's no wind. And she seemed to get away so fast. Ellen, go as slow as you can. I'm going forward and keep a sharp watch. We don't know what we're heading into. But I've got her throttled way down. Hey! Oh, oh, we here? Quick, what put her happened? in reverse! Reverse! Oh. Quick, put her in reverse. Maybe we can back off. Now, here, let me try. That's no use. Oh, we've gone to ground. Yes, we're stuck fast. (laughs) One of the most beautiful yet fearful tales that travelers tell is the Lorelei, the siren who sits on a rock combing her long golden hair and luring unwary boatmen to their doom. But a siren who smokes tobacco? We'll learn more of this unusual temptress when we return shortly with Act Two. There's nothing so eerie as the feel of a ship gone aground. A living, pulsing body beneath your feet goes suddenly dead. Aboard the Lady D, only Susie slept that night. 
Ellen and Richard kept an anxious vigil, waiting to see what the dawn would bring. Where were they? How great was the damage to their boat? On the last question hung the safety, perhaps the survival, of the ship and her crew. Ellen, come up on deck. You've got to see this. What, dear? Look at that sunrise. Isn't it magnificent? Oh, oh God. You're the one man alive who could run a valuable boat aground in the middle of nowhere and greet the dawn like Shelley. Mm, some sort of ship is sure to pass by. Meantime, this is a great adventure. Mm -hmm. Well, the tide runs out. That'll be an adventure. The boat's going to roll over on her side. No, she won't. She's built like a sea skip. They used to pull them right up on the beach to unload the catch. So, give us a kiss, Cassandra. <laughs> Good morning, darling. <laughs> Well, I guess I'd better go ashore and see if I can find a water supply on, on our desert island. Is this really a desert island? I'm afraid so, sleepyhead. And your father's playing Robinson... Co Richard, look. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, here comes Friday. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You are it. What'd he say? I think he said we're early. Er early for what? Uh, what island is this? Campbell's Island. Campbell's Island? Yes, mistress. I'm Campbell. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Campbell? I'm Richard Stevens. Uh, this is my wife. Good morning, mistress. Uh, my daughter. Welcome. Did you say we were early? Yes, yes. Usually September come before she bring a book. Who? Oh. The lady who smoked the pipe. A pipe? Yes, a long clay pipe. You did not see her. No? We smelled her pipe. Is Campbell's Island... I, I mean, is there a town here? Oh. Ho, ho, ho. Campbell, the only man here. Oh, we missed the harbor channel. Campbell's Island. I have no harbor. The lady said there was a channel. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sometimes she say that. You mean she lied to us? Maybe. You want your boat. Your boat. She nice. Oh, well, won't you come aboard? Thank you, sir. Uh, can I... Can I give you a cup of coffee? Uh, no, thank you, mistress. Oh, your wheel. I like a good old-fashioned wheel to steer with. You pay a lot for that. Oh, the compass. Well, the ship's well equipped. This is the ship's belt. Brass. Must cost dear. You have a radio? Uh, just a receiving set. Now, uh, Mr. Campbell, about getting off the beach. <laughs> you stuck fast, man. Well, if you have a boat and a tow line at high tide. No, man. My motor too small. Just a little outboard. I sail to the other island. Well, there are other islands near? It ours to sail there. Uh, could they send out a workboat from another island? Maybe. We have to fetch them. No wireless on Combo's Island. You mean go in your little sailboat? Oh, no, mistress. You and the child must stay here. My boat is small. If I try to keep a big boat, she take it. You mean the lady with the pipe? Well, now... She has a boat. She ought to be willing to... No, man. Mistress Bonnie have no boat. That's the trouble. She look for a boat. All the time she look. Bonnie. Did you say Bonnie? And Bonnie? You know about her? Yes, but she died 200 years ago. That's what they say. Do you mean that we were talking to a... A girl? Of course not, Susie. There are no such things. I talked to a ghost. I talked to Susie, a ghost. Susie, sensible. There are no such things as a ghost. <laughs> Your boat is stuck fast on Campbell's Island. What true? Why, yes, but... If the ghost, she don't bring you. How you think you got here? <laughs> <laughs> Campbell and Susie are certainly getting along together. Look at them striding ahead of us. He's striding. She's trotting. What a big, powerful man he is. And his skin, like ebony. Yeah. 
How old do you think he is? Well, I don't know. Forty? Well, I'm eager to see his boat. Listen, I hate to think of your starting out all alone with him. I have to go for help. Well, why can't he go by himself? Oh, I don't know. He doesn't seem willing to do that. Did you notice the way he examined our boat equipment? Yeah, like he was taking inventory. Yeah, but what do they call those people who lure ships to their doom by putting out beacon lights? Wreckers. Yeah. You think he's a wrecker? The thought crossed my mind. Oh, but we did hear a woman's voice. Now, look, there could be two explanations for that. Either there is a woman on this island in spite of what Campbell says, or, or he's a ventriloquist. Look. Look, Ellen, look down there. Why, it's a castle. A ruin. A burnt-out ruin. How in the world on this desert island? I know what that is. I've seen those burnt mansions before. This was a plantation in the slave days. Oh. When the slaves rebelled, they burned the house to the ground. Half of it is still standing. Yeah. And now the house and the island have found a new master. <laughs> Welcome. You like a drink before lunch? Lunch? Yes, yes, I give you a nice lunch. You like foie gras, caviar, potty shrimp, <laughs> any kind of wine? Nothing, thank you. A vodka Collins will be just fine. Vodka Collins. Soon come back. Mama, Mr. Campbell says there's an ice-cold spring behind the house and coconuts and pineapples and... Hey, look in the corner there. Cast bronze... And enormous. A propeller. That's worth a lot of money. And that wheel, it's huge. Must have come off a schooner. What does it say on this plate, Mama? Duchess of the Caribbees. This oh. one says, Rita Chu. This one is Morning Star at SS. What's this word? The SS Odyssey. Oh, Richard. Yeah. All of ships. Don't wreckers usually murder their victims? Now, Ellen, we don't know that he's a wrecker. You uh, like my house? Oh. oh, it's lovely. I have good life, man, since I learned to get along with Mistress Bonnie. Uh, how did you come here in the first place, uh, Mr. Campbell? I was fisherman, hard work, no money. One night, she take my boat. I swim to this island. I see all these rich things here on the beach. So I come back in a new boat. She put that one on the devil's thumb. What's the devil's thumb? Big rock. The devil, he put his thumb up at low tide. Then he pull it down at high tide. Then up at low tide. He hide it again just below the water. Along come a sailor man... Up come the thumb, right through the bottom of the boat. <laughs> the devil, I think he good friend of Mistress Bonnie. Uh, uh, Mr. Campbell, you say it'll take all day to get to the nearest boat yard? In my boat. But they have work boat. Uh -huh. Much quicker with power. They return here with you in two, three hours. And then uh, can we start tomorrow morning? Yes, man. Five o'clock to catch the tide. I have things to sell very dear. Better than fish. Oh, yes, yes. Better than fish. Oh, oh. it feels good to stretch out. Oh, I'm exhausted. Oh, I was certainly glad to get back to our boat. Yeah. I'm afraid I'm too nervous to sleep, though I... Oh, I dread the thought of our separating tomorrow. Mm. When I think of you all by yourself on the sea with that giant of a man, I, I'm so frightened. Why won't he go alone to get help? That would be perfectly normal, wouldn't it? Unless, unless there's a price on his head. Richard? Richard? Oh, Richard, are you... Oh, Richard... Dear, I'll never get to sleep. She's an able ship. What? Who's 
that? Over the side with you, lad! And mine! Walk on cat's feet! Who's there? Who's there? Who are you? Ah, good evening, lady. I'm just admiring your ship. May I come aboard? There's somebody with you. I heard you talking. Aye, but they all ran at the sound of your voice. <laughs> Men, a craven lot. Jack Rackham was the same. But Mary Reed stood beside me. We held off the king's men till our pistols were empty. And they boarded and knocked the cutlasses out of our hands. Ah, Mary died in prison, poor soul. She was with child. Ah, but that was days ago. Days? It was more than that. Perhaps. I've lost count of time. Will you join me in a pipe? No, thanks. A fine, soothing thing to sit on a ship's deck and blow rings at the moon. I've never seen such perfect smoke rings. <laughs> Ghosts. Ghosts? Aye. The ghost of wedding rings I should have worn. <laughs> Calico Jack calls it that. A captivating man was Jack with his black, gypsy, wild curls. Ah, they hanged him nonetheless. I stayed till Mary breathed her last, and then... And then? What happened? <laughs> Not all the king's men could ever find out. But come, what will you take for your ship? She's not for sale. Oh, come, come. I must have a ship. They'd be after me. You'd not want to see poor Angie swinging in the wind like Calico Jack, would you? No, I wouldn't want to see that, but they can't harm you now. They're gone. All turned to dust long ago. No, put me in iron. No, my dear, no. I must have a ship. Listen, I have something worth hundreds of ships. I'll trade it now for this miserable little craft. What is it? Rackham and I, we sailed with Blackbeard once. Blackbeard? The same. Now, come close, lad. I know where Blackbeard buried his treasure. Blackbeard's treasure? A great treasure it was. The booty from three rich Spanish merchantmen, laden with gold and silver. You have a map? A chart? No need. I know where it is. Come with me, lass. We'll slip out on the next time. Aren't you forgetting that you drove us aground last night? A good storm will set you afloat. Campbell says the big storms don't come till September. Aye, but sometimes they do. We'll see to that. So, it's a bargain. You'll sail with me. No. No, no, I can't. You'd abandon me then, betray me. No, but but I... I, I must have a first ship. They'd be after me. They'll overtake me, and this time they'll hang me. In mercy's name, last help me. I can't. There's a great gulf between us, Anne. You're a dream, a, a figment. And when I wake up, I'll still be here, but you'll be gone. I can't help you because... Because you're nothing. You're nothing but a dream. Anne? Anne? Where are you? Come back. Come back. There's an apparition for you. A whistling, pipe-smoking lady with a cutlass at her belt. But why did she leave so abruptly? Was she offended at being called a nothing, a figment? Well, none of us likes to hear the truth about himself. Least of all, a ghost. 
We'll follow Anne Bonny's ruthless quest for a ship when we return shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago. A spectral lady bent on seizing a ship or a laughing West Indian intent only on gathering up the spoils. Ellen doesn't know which she fears most as she watches the dawn stretch its rosy fingers across the uncharted island where the cruiser Lady D lies stranded in the sand. That was a damn good breakfast, Ellen. I had a depressing dream last night. Oh? Well, at least I think it was a dream. Yeah. Anne Bonnie boarded the Lady D, and we had a long talk. And I felt sorry for her. She was frightened. That scared ghost, huh? That's a switch. Yeah, well, she was terrified. Oh, darling. I hate to see you go off with that awful man in that little boat. Oh, now, Ellen, dearest, <laughs> you mustn't worry. I wish we could stay together. See, it's so treacherous. Campbell's been sailing these waters all his life. Oh, yes. And he's lost two boats. He told us so. And besides, you're going out in a tiny boat with a with a criminal. He's not. He, he gathers salvage. That's that's all we really know about him. Good morning. She turned now. Time to go. Ask me a line. I'll make you fast to our stern. Gotch. Got it. Come up on deck, Susie. Daddy's leaving. Come on, darling. Take care. I want to go, too. So do I, but we can't, darling. I don't want to stay here. Morning, Mr. Susie. Good morning. I want to go with you, Daddy, please. Now, there isn't room for us all. You and Mommy take care of each other. Don't go, Daddy. Mr. Susie, you go to my house. You can look at the books. Pretty pictures. Now, when I get into the boat with Mr. Campbell, we're going to let you free the line and cast it off. Now, see how quickly you can do it. Here I go. <laughs> Hurry, cast us off. Uh, be good now. We'll be back before you know it. Aren't you going to start the motor? No. The tide. He take us out. Then I put up the sail. Oh, darling. You slicker. A quick shower might Not come Not a up. chance. <laughs> Look at the sky. No. No stormy weather. Not if Aunt Bonnie, she don't whistle up the wind. What? What did you say? No storm. Not if she don't whistle up the wind. She do that sometimes. Yes, man. Ooh, we she do that. Long in Campbell's house, Susie. We should be getting back to the Lady D. It's still raining. Hmm. I thought it was one of those quick little tropical showers, but just look out there. The water's all ruffled. White caps. I'm hungry. Let's go back to the Lady D. We'll be soaked. I'll tell you what, let's do. Why don't I go back alone and get you in? No, darling. It doesn't matter if I get wet. I'm in my bathing suit. No, Susie, no. You always say no. Daddy will let me. He's only a little way. Please. Well, you promise you'll come straight back? I promise. No loitering now. I won't. <laughs> Oh, I'm not scared, but... You'll have to step smartly to save her. I don't know how. 
come aboard. I'm going to get my mama's raincoat. I promise. Ha <laughs> ha, see there. What? She's floating free. But this great tide will drive her further up on the beach. Daddy put out an anchor on the beach. The waves will carry her up over the anchor and dash her to pieces on those rocks up there. Oh, no. But you can save her if you weren't afraid. I'm not scared. Then, up with the mantle, lass. I can't put up the sails. I'm not big enough. Ah, that's a pity. The ship is lost. Lost. But I can start the engine. Can you not? Sure, anybody could do that. You just turn that little key there. She starts right off. She's saved. Start her up. I can't lift that big anchor, though. Cast it off! Cast it off! Better than lose an anchor than a ship! Daddy says you always start the engine first. Aye, aye, Captain. I'm too short to reach the gear shifting. I know. I'll get something to stand on. Here. Daddy's tool chest will do. Now, let's see. He caught this little thing to choke. Hurry! She's swinging a boat! I've never done this before. Now, I'll turn the key. See? She started right off. Now I put the motor in reverse. The anchor on the beach. Boy, for God. I'll go forward and untie it. Can you free it? back to the boatyard. They say the authorities are sending out a helicopter. We'll hear from it soon, and when we do, we'll go right to her. This tug is faster than it looks. Oh, wait, it's terrible. Isn't there anything else we can do, Mr. Wyatt? I don't know what to say to you folks. We've been around the island several times. There's no sign of a ship. My baby. 
I should never have let her out of my sight. I had no idea she'd try to start the engine. Ellen, darling, don't. <laughs> we'll find her. She was only gone from the house just about ten minutes. I set out right after her. I know, I know, dearest. And then when I got to the to the beach, the boat was, was out a little way from the shore. And Susie was standing on the deck crying. And the boat was just drifting away. It went around that point of land out there. And I ran to the other side of the island. But I never saw it again. Oh, no, dearest, please, don't cry. There was just nothing I could do and, until you came back in the tugboat. Uh, I know, we'll find her. I wish that man Camel was here. He knows these waters. Why didn't he come back with you? He dropped me at the public dock and took off like a shot. The police have had him in for questioning several times. There have been too many wrecks in the last few years. But they never seem to get anything out of him. So, uh, you ran into him too, huh? Yeah. He told us. Hey, uh, wait a minute. What, what did he call it? Uh, uh, that rock. Uh, the Devil's Thumb. Yes. The submerged rock. Yeah, do you know where it is, Mr. Wyatt? Well, there's only one I know of. A very dangerous spot. Right in the path of a swift current. And sometimes it's, uh, well, there are shoals to very bad place. Oh, Richard. Mr. Wyatt, uh, could yes. we... Yes, of course. I know about where it lies. Now, we'll run down on it. Best to have a look. This is the tugboat Swallow calling Coastal Police Launch. Doug Swallow to Police Launch. Come in, please. Over. Police Launch to Swallow. I read you. Over. That's good. I can hardly hear you, but it doesn't matter. We've located the missing cruiser, Lady D. Over. Is the child okay? Over. Yeah, it's a miracle. The kid was alone on board. She managed to drop a small anchor onto a submerged sandbar near the Devil's Thumb. I have the boat in tow, and we're heading back to port. Over. Glad to hear it. Over. Right. Over and out. Well, Susie, you're quite a sailor. But how did you know that sandbar was there? You couldn't see it. The lady told me. The lady with the pipe. The lady? She's not a real lady. She's a ghost. A ghost? Well, it's hard to explain. We don't believe in such things, of course, but... She went away for a while, but when I started to cry, she came back. A ghost? I'm sure there's some perfectly natural explanation. She said to put out a long, long line so the anchor wouldn't drag. Well, that was sound advice, but I don't understand. And you see, Mr. Wyatt, I've been telling Susie these pirate stories. It, and I'd had a very vivid dream, and she heard us talking about that. You know how impressionable children are. Excuse me. Do you smell something burning? Something... Something burning? Yeah, smells like, um, like tobacco. Richard. Uh, Mr. Wyatt, don't you think we better get both these boats back into harbor just as fast as we can? Well, those were the known facts of the strange voyage of the Lady D. To this day, Susie insists she talked to a ghost. Ellen believes it was a startling example of the power of the imagination. And Richard has been reading up on the dematerialized nature of modern physics. And he wonders if somewhere in space there exists a vast psychological viewing screen picking up impressions from other times and through which it was the fate of the Lady D to pass. I'll be back shortly. And now a brief footnote to the story you've just heard. Among seafaring men, there is a belief as ancient as the art of navigation itself that when the wind dies down, a sailor may bring it to life again by the simple act of whistling. 
The mystery concerning the fate of Anne Bonny, as well as her life of piracy with Calico Jack, Mary Reed, and the nefarious Blackbeard is not legend. It is thoroughly documented historical fact. Our cast included Augusta Dabney, Paul Hecht, Corinne Orr, Margaret Barker, and Dan Ocko. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Joe. Gang? Joe, there's something crazy going on in this house. Something real crazy. Now, Amy, honey. Joe, Joe, listen to me. There's something wrong. Jack says he never saw me before in his life. What? And never proposed marriage to me, and then he did. And she, her, his wife, she came to my bedroom with an axe and Hold it, for chimney's sake, hold it. Amy, you're not making sense. Oh, I know I'm not, because what's happening here, what, what, what's happened to me, he doesn't make sense Look, either. will somebody explain this? A mistake of some kind has been made. A mistake? Your sister, she... Well, I, I haven't wanted to spell this out in so many words, but since you're here now and can take care of her, Joe, I'm afraid your sister is crazy. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... Dogs, Billy Big Rigs, Big Strappers, Flatbed Cowboys, Freight Shakers, Trucklets, 18 Wheelers, Deadheads, Yard Dogs, Get Your Ears On? Whatever you call yourselves or whatever call sign or moniker is thrust upon you, this episode's dedicated to all you truckers driving the boulevard, keeping our bellies full, shelves stocked, septics cleaned, and brains entertained with what you're hauling. In the eyes of this ratchet jaw, and I'm honored to have you listening. Maybe once in a while grab your CB, head to Sesame Street, and tell other drivers how to join this weirdo convoy. Appreciate it. May your brake checks be few, your shutter trouble be absent, and your bear bites non-existent. Keep it cool on the stool. This is Spooky Santa, and I'm 10 and on the side.
give me a penny, mademoiselle. Just a penny for an old lady. I'll tell you a story if you'll give me a penny, monsieur. Sorry, Gypsy, not today. How about you, madame? Me? How about a penny for my story? Well, Just uh... a penny for a story. A story you won't forget. I never could resist a story. It's a deal. You tell the story and I'll give you the penny. Well, we'd better sit down on the front steps of the museum here. Now, the story starts in an attic of an old pension. The story is of two lovers who were sitting together in an old attic in a two-gable building where the wind softly shook the old shutters as it blew by. The girl was beautiful, and those two were in love. And she was telling him the story of the vendetta. Jenny, my darling, tell me about the vendetta. It was so long ago, Louis. But I'll never forget the fires and the flames. Sometimes at night I still think of myself as that little girl in Corsica, sitting with her mother in the living room. I can still see our sworn enemies, the Porter family, breaking in, pouring kerosene on our rugs and see the fire start. Those fires which were meant as our funeral pyre. I can still hear my mother scream before she died. Somehow, my father saved my life and told me to hide in the wastelands and wait for him. And then there was more fire, more flames, and the vendetta was settled. The Porter family was dead. And then we came to Paris, to the pension next door. I remember the ugly white stone building, the long, rickety flight of stairs to the three-room flat on the third floor. I remember the landlady who was so kind and showed us to our rooms, talking in that empty hallway. You'll like it here, Monsieur de Piombo. You and your little girl. Pretty child, isn't she? Watch out for the stairs. Thank you. I'll be careful, Madame Manet. We're all one happy family here. A German family lives on this floor, and a young newlywed couple lives on this floor. And guess who owns the building next door? Monsieur Servin. He's an artist and runs an exclusive school for young women who are interested in the arts. Well, these are your quarters. Your room's in the back. The child's room is just to the left. You have your own cooking facilities if you wish to use them. Yes, you told us. Well, I guess you want to be alone to make friends with your new quarters. Rooms are like people have to be treated with kindness. Be happy. Are you tired, Jenny? Very, very tired. Father, are we going to see Mother again? They took her from us, Jenny. But the porters have paid for it. With their lives. All of them. You're all I have left, Jenny. You're all I have left in the world. You'll be a little queen someday. I'll make you a queen, Jenny. And Paris will be at your feet. You've such lovely black hair, Jenny. Such lovely, warm black hair, darling. Never leave me. Father, darling, I'll never leave you. How could I? We belong together. And so you and your father lived in the pension? And you were happy, Jenny? Oh, so happy, Louis. You've no idea. Well, when I was 20 years old, I started to paint. Our landlady showed my painting to Monsieur Servin, and Monsieur granted me a scholarship in his school. My easel was in the corner of the studio, and when I climbed on a chair, I could peer through the skylight into Monsieur Servin's attic across the way in the other gable. The attic always fascinated me. It was dark and lonely, and struck a responsive chord somewhere inside me. And then last week, I saw you there, darling. And I knew you were wounded. I started to paint you. I stood on the chair looking at you. Laurie was singing behind me and Amelia was talking too much. The little chime clock on the wall chattered too. They say the soldier escaped somewhere in this neighborhood. But they'll get him. There's no doubt of that. After all, he deserves to die. Every Bonapartist soldier deserves to die. After all, who are they? Nothing but a lot of cutthroats and Corsicans. Amelia, what a cruel thing to say. 
Think of our darling Ginevra. Oh, honestly, Laurie, you make me sick. Hmm. What are you doing standing on a chair, Ginevra? I, I was seeing something in my mind's eye. You were talking about Napoleon, Amelia. I'm interested in your views. Oh, of course. You're a Corsican. Are you for or against Napoleon? Since Napoleon's been banished, it doesn't make much difference, does it? Well, maybe not. Except there's a soldier of Napoleon's army hiding out in this district. The police might be interested in you, Ginevra, if you're a sympathizer. If somebody were to tell them about you. Amelia, stop it. Let's see what you're painting, Ginevra. Oh, no, no, Laura, please, oh, I... darling, I... it's a lovely piece of work. Who is he? Who is who? This man Ginevra's painting. A oh, uh, man? Well, we didn't know. Mademoiselle, would you please return to your easels? No artist ever gave anything to art who supplied the world with gossip. We were just admiring the Corsican's work, Monsieur Sauvin. She's painting a portrait of a young man. Mm -hmm. Well, Mademoiselle Amelia, I'm sure if you worked as diligently as Mademoiselle Ginevra, somebody would admire your work. It is four o'clock, ladies. Time for you to go home. I'm only half finished, Monsieur. Four o'clock, Mademoiselle Laurie. Your family will worry. Naturally, Laurie. Come along and stop being super conscientious. Good night, Ginevra. Oh, wait for me. I'll be right along. Mademoiselle Ginevra. Oh, yes, monsieur. Would you mind staying after class? Of course not, monsieur. Good night, monsieur Sauvin. Good, Good night, night, monsieur Good Sauvin. night, mademoiselle. You'll find Mademoiselle Ginevra very interesting to talk to, monsieur Sauvin. Especially if you ask her why she stands on a chair looking in an attic window. Good night, monsieur Sauvin. Good night, mademoiselle Amelia. I'm sorry, monsieur. I caused you so much trouble. That is a fine painting, Ginevra. How long have you known the soldier has been hiding in my attic? Just today. How much has Mademoiselle Amelia seen of him? Just this painting. Monsieur, please take me to him. Nobody knows he's up there but me. He's wounded and he looks so lonely. Your father would never forgive me if I do. And I'd never forgive you if you don't. Please, monsieur. Nobody will ever know, I swear it. Please, Monsieur Servan. Please. And so he brought me to the attic. And I met you and loved you from the first time I saw you two weeks ago, Louis. Oh, I, I know all the words that rhyme with your name. I know all the funny little wrinkles in your face. And the way you smile and the way you talk. Oh, Jenny. Jenny, darling, darling, you don't know what you're saying. I'm a hunted man. If I'm caught, I'll be hung. If you were killed, I'd be by your side. I'm sick and wounded. And you know so little about me. I know everything about you. We're fellow Corsicans. You're a brave soldier, and I love, love, love you. Oh. Where you go, I shall go. And your people shall be my people. Jenny, I've wanted to tell you. I've wanted to tell you so many times. Oh, darling, darling. Don't stop me, please, darling. We can't be married. Don't you understand? I love you. I love you so much. Oh, Louis, father can help you leave the country and I can join you later. And we'll return to Corsica. Corsica, Jenny. Warm sun and green meadows and the yellow pasture land. Oh. Oh. oh, darling, you'll like Corsica so very much like it. Tempestuous and warm. And your eyes are brown like the trees in the fall. And when you're happy, they're brown with red flames. Those are the fires of a vendetta, Louis. And when you're sad, the light dies. Like the sun on the ocean. I love you. I love you, Eugenie. If only I were brave enough to own you. I'd own you in a little bit of Corsica, in a world of our own. Oh. Oh, don't make it any more difficult for me than it is. What's wrong, Jenny? Look at the skylight in the studio. I could have sworn I saw somebody at the skylight window. Oh, nothing more than the cleaning woman, Jenny. Oh, my little darling. My darling, Jenny. Jenny for Bella. Bella, Bella, Jenny. What are you doing standing on the chair looking out the skylight wind, Amelia? Oh, what are you looking at? It, you know very well what I'm looking at, Laurie. You've known all along about Ginevra and her lover and their secret rendezvous, haven't you? What if I have? 
My father, as head of the Paris police force, will be very much interested in finding this escaped soldier. If you help the soldier escape, I'll tell my father you helped him to escape. They'll put you in jail, Laurie. In a dark hole of a jail, with rats and roaches, and they'll forget about you and... Let me go, that Amelia. That is, if you don't keep your mouth shut. My arm. What are you going to do, Amelia? Wait and see, Laurie. And if you want to stay out of jail, you keep your mouth shut. I think I'd better see Ginevra's father. Monsieur de Piombo? Yes? I'm Amelia Farrar, a schoolmate of your daughter's. Oh, please come in, mademoiselle. My daughter is late from school, but I'm sure she'll be home soon. Well, I... I didn't come here to talk to your daughter, monsieur. I came to talk to you. A sort of ugly thing happened at our school lately, and... Oh, well, it's sort of difficult to explain, but... Well, Monsieur Sauvain has been allowing an escaped soldier to hide in his attic. <laughs> Not so bad. The rascal, how could he? Well, every day, Ginevra and this soldier see each other, and I hear they intend to marry. It's the scandal of the school, monsieur, and, well, if he's arrested, Ginevra will be in trouble, and... Are you positive of this, mademoiselle? Oh, yes, and I'm worried for her. You see, my father is head of the Paris police, and I found out this escaped soldier is a fellow Corsican of yours, and, well, you probably know him... He's parading under the name of Louis D'Angelo. But in reality, his name is Luigi Porta. Youngest son of the Porta family and the only survivor of a tragic fire which occurred in Corsica 15 years ago. Luigi Porta. <laughs> I'm sure Ginevra can take care of herself. Well, shall I report him to the police? No, maybe it won't be necessary for 24 hours. No, no, I think I'll wait. Good day, Monsieur de Piombo. Ginevra. Ginevra, Bella. Not a porter. Oh, no, Ginevra, me. Not... Not marrying Luigi Porter. Not my own daughter. <laughs> in my hands cannot be my daughter's. But if she be married to a porter, she must die by my hands by the terms of the vendetta. for you here on the landing, Amelia. What were you doing in my father's apartment? Don't you wish you knew? Tell me, Amelia, or I'll choke it out of you. I was always told the Corsicans were a crude people. I didn't know how true that was until Shh. now. Don't speak so loud. What do you know about me? What do you know? Everything that's important to know about you. I know that you're Corsican peasant blood and I don't like associating Corsican with you. Corsican peasant blood, you... <gasps> oh, you'll be sorry, Ginevra. Very sorry for this. Amelia... Me. I must know the truth. Did you tell my father about... Meeting a lover in secret? Yes. It's time somebody stopped you. Who did you say this secret lover of mine was? I didn't know you knew he is Luigi Porta. Oh, I thought you at least had loyalty to your father. Did you tell my father? Did you? Yes, Ginevra, I told your father. I oh. thought he'd prefer to know the truth. Goodbye, little princess. Someone arguing out here. Oh, oh. what's Oh, poor <laughs> Mademoiselle, don't cry. If somebody hurts our feelings, you'll get over it. Madame, Madame, would you do me a favor? Go upstairs to my father and tell him, tell him you've sent me out on errand. Please, please, Madame. 
poor child, are you in trouble? Please, please, for the love of heaven, go upstairs and tell my father you sent me out. And make the lie good. Make him believe it. You must make him believe it, madame. Please, please, go upstairs now. Go upstairs right this minute. I thought you wouldn't mind, Monsieur de Piombo, if Ginevra went on this little errand for me. Just a few blocks away to the butcher, and I, I've hurt my foot. Naturally, your foot. A, a stub the toe. For a stub toe, you walk very well. Thank you, monsieur. Very well indeed. I, I think I'd better go downstairs. Uh, don't. Please don't. I'd much rather you wait up here, Madame Manet, so that I may see this parcel Ginevra is to bring you. But, but monsieur... I said we'll wait up here, madame. Six o'clock. We'll wait till seven, madame. Till seven. She's not here by then. You and I will find her ourselves. I had to warn you, Louis. You're in such danger. Don't you understand? Father will kill you with the vendetta return. Jenny, oh, Jenny. Luigi or Louis, it makes no difference to me. Love knows no names. And I love you, Luigi Porter, with my whole heart. But if we're married, you'll become a porter. And by the terms of a vendetta, as long as a Piomba lives, all porters must die. If you become my wife, you must die as well as I. Without you, Louis, I wouldn't be alive. My life, my love. We'll take our chance. If only Monsieur Servin is right. If only he can get us out of the country at midnight. We must believe it. Darling, as soon as the priest arrives and we're married, I'll return home and wait. I'll wait until midnight. Be careful, darling. Be careful. Nothing can go wrong, Luigi. The carriage will be waiting and Savannah has our passports already. How can you get out of the house without your father suspecting? I'll find a way somehow. I... Oh, oh, Monsieur Savannah, you frightened me. I'm sorry, my dear, but the priest is waiting for you. Darling Ginevra, take my arm, my sweet. Oh. Lead the way, Monsieur Servan. Father, I'm sorry I'm so late, Father. Are you angry with me? How could I be, Bellissima? Tea is ready, Ginevra. It's been ready a long time, waiting for you. I'm so sorry. Shall I warm the water? It's not necessary. Come, Carissima. Sit by the window with me, as you did when you were a little girl. Very little girl. Of course. How gay the table looks, Father. Almost as if we were celebrating something. Candlesticks, the best tea plate. Sit down, darling. Here, next to me. And the very best teapot. And the old Corsican knife. It's a lovely knife. I've always loved it. What are we going to carve with it? You've no cake. Your tea, Jeanette. Thank you. I knew you'd leave me for some man or other. I've always known that, Jenny. Come, Carissima. Sit close to me. As you did when you were a little girl. But, Father... You're still my little girl. Father, you I... You draw away from me. Are you afraid of me? No, Father, no, darling, no. My little princess. My beautiful Ginevra. Carissima. With your heavy, long black hair. Such heavy, warm black hair. Oh, the hair is dark. Oh, the hair is thick and fragrant. Oh, the hair is beautiful. But yours, Jenny, yours is Corsica. Corsica. Don't look at me, Ginevra, Cara. Cara, Cara, look straight ahead out the window. Yes, Father. What do you see out there? Trees and grass and people laughing, happy people. A boy and a girl and a baby. And an old man, a lonely old man, Cara. There's no old man out there, Father. Father, what are you reaching for? The knife on the table. Why? You and the knife are the only two things left to me from Corsica. No, don't turn around. Keep looking out the window, Ginevra. Keep telling me what you see, my darling, Carissima. Why, Father? Are the boy and the girl happy? Father! Father Ginevra, are they happy, darling? Father! 
father. Father. I'll hold you in my arms, my darling, and the pain will go away. Father. I waited for you for two long hours. I stood by the window watching and waiting. I saw Sir Van leave and return with the priest. Oh, Cara, Cara, Jenny. Then you came home. Not my carissima. Not my darling. Oh, Father, the pain. The pain now. You came back to me. The wife of Luigi Porter. Your mother's murderer. You were piombo to become a porter. The pain, Father. The pain. <laughs> Goodbye, Ginebra. Your fear. Your warm black hair. The knife. There. Draw it out so slowly. And my life for your life. The life of a piombo for the life of a porter. Carissima. Carmilla. Carmilla. You'll not be alone. Not alone. In death. Jenny? Jenny, we've waited so long. Jenny? Jenny, my darling, what's happened to... She's dead. Both of them. And dead. Oh, how could dead hates come out of the past and murder the only beauty in my life? Oh, Jenny, my darling, darling Jenny. My wife for five short hours. The knife. Yes, that's the way. Yes. The knife. Here. Where to be sure. Goodbye, my Jenny. Luigi. Luigi. Jenny. I'm coming to meet you. I hear your voice. Luigi. What have you done? Luigi. I'm coming, Jenny. Luigi. Oh, Luigi, could you wait? I'm not going to die, Luigi. I'm not going to die. Jenny didn't die. She lay for months in a hospital, trying to die, not caring to make any effort to do anything. The doctors made her live. She had no will to, and she hasn't since. She hasn't since. What happened to her, Gypsy? What did she do? She lived in memories. But who cares? Who cares about Ginevra now? She might be wandering the streets. An old woman. An old woman telling stories for pennies. Here, Gypsy. Here's your penny. Thank you, madame. Thank you. A story? A story for a penny? Just a penny, please. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have heard the immortal tale, The Vendetta. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. <laughs>
If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Wait a minute. Have you heard the weird tales of the Whistler? I'm the Whistler. Sanitarium, Harvey. Is he still unconscious? Yes. Here comes the attendant. We're all ready for him, Mrs. Jackson. Take his feet, Harold. Oh, had to tie him, eh? Yes, I had to give him a good one on the chin. You'll have to watch him. He may try to get away when he comes to. Don't worry, we've got a lot of tough cases here. Don't let him know who brought him here. And don't let him know I had anything to do with it. Leave everything to us. It's a two-hour drive back to the city, Donna. Yes, sir. Well, I'll, I'll phone you tomorrow. Good. If anything happens, we'll call you. Thank you. Uh, good night. Saturday night, and again, CBS presents The Whistler. I, The Whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales. I know many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the mysterious tale of Death Has a Thirst. The long black car with the handsome man at the wheel and the woman beside him returns to the highway and speeds on through the night. The man and woman sit staring ahead, lost in thought. The man is Harvey Davis, the woman Mrs. Victor Jackson, wife of the unconscious man recently deposited at the sanitarium. I'm sorry I dragged you into this, Harvey, but I had to have some help and I knew I could depend on you. It's all right, Donna. I only hope it'll do some good. Victor never drank a drop while we were in school. He didn't drink when we were first married. But after his father died and Victor took over the business, he started. It's a huge concern and I guess he just couldn't take it. He's always had an inferiority complex. But the thing that hurts me most is that the drinking has completely changed him. Why, he's suspicious of every move I make. He accuses me of the most disgraceful things. He accuses me of lying to him about everything and of being in love with, with other men. Oh, countless things. Other men? <laughs> what men? Any men I speak to. <laughs> Even you, Harvey. Me? Well, after all, if he's going to be suspicious of any man, it would logically be me. Why? You've brought most of your troubles to me. He knows that. I'm as good a victim as any. He knows I'm terribly fond of you. Are you, Harvey? From the first day I met you, I said, here's a woman, a strong woman. 
Maybe she'll develop some backbone in my willy-nilly friend, Victor. That's very nicely put, Harvey. Let's hope the sanitarium does him some good. If it doesn't, I don't know what I'll do. Don't worry, Donna. Just remember, I'll do anything for you. Thank you, Harvey. About midnight, the black sedan arrives at the Jackson mansion. The butler greets Harvey and Donna at the door. Evening, Mrs. Jackson. Evening, Mr. Davis. Evening. Uh, Dr. Saunders is in the library, ma'am. He's waiting for you. Dr. Saunders at this hour? What on earth does he want? You'd better see him, Donna. Maybe he knows. How could he? Come with me, Harvey. Of course. Oh, good evening, Dr. Saunders. Good evening, Donna. Evening, Harvey. Hello, Doctor. This is quite a surprise. I can imagine. I, um... Um, Harvey and I, we've just been for a little drive. I felt I needed some air. All right, so? Um, did you come to see Victor? Uh, Victor isn't here. Really? But I know where he is. You do? He's in a cheap dive of a rooming house downtown. What? But that's impossible. That's where he always goes. Well, you're wrong this time, Doctor. I took him by force to a sanitarium tonight. Harvey, help me. Maybe they can do something for him. You told the sanitarium that I was his physician, didn't you? Yes. Well, they called me an hour ago. He's escaped. (gasps) What? They said he came to and broke away from them. I know where he usually goes, and I can find him. If you want me to find him. What are you inferring, Doctor? Donna, I know what you've been through with Victor. I know what a trial it's been... I've tried and you've tried. We've all tried everything we could do to make him stop. Not many women would have put up with what you have. We've dragged him through before. We probably can do it again. I just thought, well, maybe you'd had enough. You do know where he is? Yes, I'm pretty sure I know. Well, then find him. I'm I'm determined to cure him if I have to take him to a desert island. That's an idea. A long ocean trip might be the answer. Should have to hog time. I could do that, too. Very well, I'll have a talk with him. I'll phone you in the morning. Good night. Good night, Doctor. Oh, Harvey. No, no, no. You've done your best, Donna. Oh, but I feel so hopeless. I don't know what to do. (laughs) Try the desert island. Why not? Harvey, it might work, mightn't it? You can help. Your yacht, Dr. Saunders, may be right. Oh, at least it's worth a try. I wonder. Please, Harvey, it may be the answer. I can't get away just now, but if you're determined, you're welcome to the aunt. Oh, please, I, I'd feel better if you came along. All right, Donna. I'll go. I'll arrange it. But he won't want to come. We'll take him aboard by force. Shanghai? Well, all right. Just let me know when you find him, and I'll arrange everything. <sighs> He sure was plastered. Well, I'll leave you alone with him, Doctor. Thanks. That high pole will bring him out of this. Victor. Victor. What? What? What's going on here? Who are you? Get away. Quiet, quiet. Take it easy, Victor. Huh? Who, who are you? Doc Saunders. Doc? Oh, what do you want? I want to talk to you, Victor. It's very important. Yeah. Important? Come on, Victor. Snap out of it. Okay. Hey, what's the idea? What you slap me for? To wake you up. I've got to talk to you. Oh. oh, hello, Doc. What are you after? Is your head clear? Uh, I guess so. Well, then listen to me. You know where you are? Yeah. Yeah, my old haunt. You know how you got here? Well, let me see. I... No, I I can't seem to remember. Well, I'll tell you where you're going if you don't pull yourself together. Where? To the insane asylum. Did you say asylum? I did. I haven't told you this, but your great-grandfather died insane. What? And that was your father's greatest fear, that he would be a victim. And there's nothing that hastens final mental breakdown more than alcohol. Insanity? Are you just telling me that? No, I can prove it. Good Lord. Do you want that to happen to you? Well, no, no. Oh, but I... Well, I, I just can't seem to quit. 
You're going away, Vic. Away? Where? I'm sending you on a long voyage with no liquor. Oh, no. No, you're not. No, no, no. I'll get hold of myself. You said that before. I can take it or leave it alone if I want to. But you haven't so far. You've gone from bad to worse. Now you're going where you can't get it. But, Doc, I, I can't. I'd die. I, I couldn't stand it. You'll stand it and like it. If I have to kill you. No. No, I won't be pushed around by anyone. I know who's back of this, Donna. She wants to get rid of me. Asylum, yeah. Yeah, that'd suit her fine. She'd like that. So she can cavort around with Harvey and all the others. Shut up, Vic. You're all planning to get rid of me. You don't like me. You're taking a trip. Get rid of me and you all share in the estate. Well, you'll see how much good it'll do. Oh. But you are taking a trip, Victor. <laughs> and now, here you are, Victor. Several hundred miles at sea. And worried, too, aren't you, Victor? That talk about insanity really upsets you. You believe it, too. Don't you? <laughs> uh, what? Oh, what's this? Where am I? Donna. Do you feel better? What is this? It, it's moving. I, oh, I feel dizzy. I don't think you're dizzy. We're on a boat, darling. What boat? We're on a boat in the middle of the ocean. A boat? Doc Saunders. That's what he said. A, a voyage. It's his oh, idea. Oh, now, Victor. Everything's going to be all right. I know what you're planning to do. You're planning to kill me. You want to get rid of me. Want me to die. You won't die. Whose boat is this? Harvey's yacht. Harvey. Now I know it's a plot. Now I know what it's all about. You and Harvey, that's it. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Victor. Harvey consented to let me have the yacht. Is he on board? Yes. Of course. You and Harvey and me a prisoner. What a perfect setup. You don't mean that, Victor. I've been suspicious of you two all along. Who else is on board? Nobody but the captain and the crew of four. And Harvey and the doctor. Where are you taking me? We're just cruising. Just cruising. Till you find the right spot. Right spot for what? To dump me overboard. No one will ever know, will they? And you'll say I jumped over. I was washed over the side. Oh, Victor, what has happened to you? You're like a stranger to me. I, I, I just don't know you. It doesn't seem possible that you're the man I married. My darling, what's happened to you? Don't you know? If I only did. Why, I'm crazy. Insane. Surely you knew that. My great-grandfather was insane, and my grandfather, and undoubtedly my father, so why not me? You're talking nonsense. No. Hasn't Doc Saunders told you what he knows? I know. Oh, come now. You three are closer than that. Stop talking such nonsense. I won't listen. Uh, I'm getting out of this cabin. I can't stand to be cooped up like oh, no, this. No, please stay here for a while, Victor. Please. Here, I... I brought you some milk. Please drink it. Milk? Ah. Oh, got a funny color to it. And it smells strange. What's in it, arsenic? It's just plain milk, Victor. Now drink it. Do you like milk, Donna? Yes, I love milk. Then drink it yourself. Fitch! Oh, all over my dress. You're trying to poison me, that's it. Now get out of here. Get out! Oh, Victor, please, darling. Get out! Oh, what do you want, Doc? How do you feel, Victor? They're trying to kill me. They plan to kill me. Who? Donna and Harvey. She just brought me some milk and it had poison in it. I could tell by the color. I think you're imagining things, Victor. No, no, I'm not. They want me out of the way. I can tell. What made you think the milk was poison? It, it was a purplish color. Here, here's the glass. Smell it. Hmm. Mm, maybe I'm not so crazy after all. I didn't all. say you were crazy. I only want you to stop drinking. Drink may bring it on. Doc, where would they get poison? Oh, come now, forget it. Do you know where they get poison, Doc? I'll see you later, Victor. Maybe. Did you send for me, Doctor? Yes. Did you take some milk to Victor? Yes, I did. What'd you put in it? Why should I put anything in it? Victor thinks you did. You should know me better than that, Doctor. You did put something in it? Oh, yes, I did. Some of that red liquid to make him quiet. Oh, yes, of course, that's what it was. 
And he threw it all over me. Oh, I... I'm thoroughly disgusted, Doctor. I... I can't go on with him this way. He isn't drinking, but... There's something wrong. I decided to give it up as a bad job. I... I'm going to get a divorce. Divorce? I'm afraid it's too late for that, Donna. Too late? Why, what do you mean? Well, there's something I haven't told you. I've been hoping it wouldn't be necessary. But after today, I've given up all hope. Why can't I get a divorce? You can't get a divorce from an insane person. Insane? Good heavens. There's been a secret in Victor's family for several generations. Not even Victor knew it. It touched his father ever so lightly, but Victor has all the symptoms. And the liquor has hastened the crack up. I couldn't be certain as long as he was drinking. But today, I realized the truth. I'm bewildered. I've never been so shocked in my life. I I wish you hadn't told me. I'm sorry, Donna. I wanted you to be on your guard. He has some strange hallucination about you and Harvey. Harvey. He thinks you're planning to do away with him. Do away with him? Oh, but that's ridiculous. I... I've never had such a thought. Never. Oh, but now I am frightened. Doctor, what about Alice? Your daughter's only eight years old. There are no symptoms, and it may miss her entirely. But think what this will mean if... If this gets out about Victor, why, it may ruin her whole life. I understand that. That must never happen. It must remain a secret. That'll be difficult. It's going to be hard to handle when that craving returns. Yes, he will. I'll think of something. I'll find a way. Doctor, come quickly. It's Harvey Davis. What's wrong, Captain? Found him in his bunk with a cord around his neck. Good heavens. Be quiet, Donna. Come along. Is he dead? No, he's breathing. Found him just in time. He'll be all right in a few minutes. Thank heaven. Harvey, Harvey. Uh, Harvey. Uh Donna, what, what's wrong? What, what's happened? Nothing much, Harvey. Just a little accident. You'll be all right. Oh, my throat. What's going on? You don't remember? No, I was just taking a little nap. I, I feel as though I'd been choked. Better tell him, Donna. Come along, Captain. Been any liquor aboard, Captain? Yes, Doctor. Several bottles in the locker in my cabin. Let's have a look. I keep it locked because I... Hey. It's been jimmied. Well, what do you know? It's all gone. I expected that. I'll skin those men alive. Don't don't blame the men, Captain. What do you mean? What the devil is that? We did something. Come on. Captain. Captain. What is it, man? What's wrong with you? The, the boilers blew up. We must have hit a reef. All three of the men of the crew were down there. We've got to abandon. I... I'm, I'm hurt bad, Captain. He's dead. See to the lifeboat. Round up the others. I'll go below. Yes, Captain. Murphy! John! Murphy! Are you there? Good Lord, what a mess. I can't imagine. <laughs> days pass. The sun beats down relentlessly on the five survivors in the open boat. The doctor watches anxiously over the still unconscious captain. And Donna and Harvey keep a constant eye on Victor, who sits alone in the end of the boat, staring at the horizon. How's the captain, Doctor? Still holding his own. Must have had a bad fall down that companionway. I don't think he fell. Good thing you went down after him. We're running low on water. I hope we sight some land today. How much water have you left in your canteen, Donna? Half full. Hey, look over there. What's that? Why, it's a ship. No, it's land. An island. Grab an oar, Victor. Come on, Doc. Well, I've looked all around. The place is as barren of food and water as the Sahara Desert. I'm afraid if we do locate any water, it won't be fit to drink. There must be water. What do you care about water? You've got a canteen full of whiskey. How much water is left? I have some, and Dr. Saunders has some. So I'd better get busy. Although my experiences on these islands uh, haven't been so good. Here's a chance to put your chemistry to use, Harvey. You know the test for lead and zinc? Yes. I'll give you two vials, some sodium sulfide tablets, and some potassium chromate. 
You know the test, one tablet of each and ten cc's with water. Mm -hmm. A dark precipitate means poison. Yes, I know. Thanks, Doc. Well, I'll start off and keep a direct line to the other side, wherever that is. Wait a minute, Harvey. I think I'll go with you. Oh, why? Oh, maybe I can help. I'd go with you, Harvey, but I'd better keep my eye on the captain. He's the only one who knows where we are. I've got to pull him through. That's all right, Doc. I don't need any help. I think I'll go anyway. All right. If you insist, come on. Harvey, wait. I'm going too. Why? Because I want to. We don't need you. But I'm coming just the same. <laughs> Please, Harvey, I, I'd like to come. All right. Let's go. Certainly hot. How do you feel, Donna? All right. How far have we come? Oh, ten miles, I should say. This is a pretty big island at that. And nothing but desert. Are you sure those last two water holes were poisoned? Certainly. Look good to me. I'm getting mighty thirsty. Better quit drinking that whiskey. It'll only make you thirstier. Harvey, can I have a little water? I'm sorry, Donna, but you'll have to suffer it as long as you can. Please wait. You suppose we'll ever get out of here? I don't know. Oh, it's all my fault. What a shame to get you into such a mess. Please forgive me, Harvey. There's nothing to forgive, Donna. I'd do it again a hundred times over. For you. Would you, Harvey? Yes. Poor Victor, what a sad thing. No one must ever know, Harvey. Promise me, if we get out of this, promise me you'll never let anyone know. No one will ever learn from me. I got him! I got what him! What on earth? Harvey, he's got a gun. Where'd he get it? Come on. I got him. Look. Look. A lizard. A big one. I knew we'd find something. Put that down. You can't eat that. There must be water around here. There must be. Where'd you get that gun? Out of the captain's locker. Better take it easy with those shells. We may need them. Yeah. Maybe I will. Have a drink? No. Uh, all right. <coughs> I'd sure like some water. How about it? There's just enough for one of us to get back. And if only one goes back, it'll be Donna. Donna. How chivalrous. Who's got the water? I have. Come on. Let's keep moving. There's water around here. There must be. And I'm going to find it. Donna, if we don't find water, he's going to start pleading for what you have. No matter how much he raves or pleads, don't give it to him. He will be, even if he threatens us with a gun. Tell him you drank it all. I want you to have the best break out of this. Thanks, Harvey. I appreciate that. I found it. Water. I found water. Hurry, Donna. Hurry. <laughs> Well, what about it? What's the test show? Just like all the rest. It's full of lead and zinc and heaven knows what else. Poison, huh? Worse, Jen. How about some of that water? What water? In Donna's canteen. There isn't any more. Who drank it? I did. You both did. You left none for me. You've got your whiskey. I can't drink whiskey all the time. You've done pretty well on it for several years. I've got to have some water. Harvey won't. You? Harvey, Harvey, Harvey. Is that all you think about, Harvey? You should have married Harvey. Perhaps you're right about that. Oh, that water's poison? I'm not drinking it, and I'm thirsty, too. Maybe you're just waiting. For what? I don't know, but I can imagine a few things. Well, we'd better stop here for the night. Are you very tired, Donna? Awfully. Better try and get some sleep. Where are you going, Victor? Just going to look around. May find something. I'm hungry. I'm going to build a fire with this brush. Don't get too far away. I'll be around. Don't worry. Keep a close watch on your canteen, Donna. I have an idea what he's up to. I'll try not to sleep, but... I'm dead tired. I'll do my best, Harvey. If he goes to sleep, I'll try to get that gun away from him. Mm -hmm. Good night, Donna. Good night, Harvey. Night comes on. The fire burns low. And only a red glow remains. Donna, in spite of herself, drops off into a sound sleep. Victor stirs from his place twenty feet away, looks about him, and crawls silently toward the sleeping Donna. Put it down, Victor. I want some water. There isn't any more. I think there is. You heard what I said. You're lying. You have got some. Victor, what is it? You've got some water and you won't give me any. Harvey. I'm wise to you. You don't want me to have any. You want me to die. You're in love with each other. You're drunk. What if I am in love with Harvey? What of it? Donna. You want me out of the way. Neither of you is very thirsty, no. Because you had some water. And you got it out of that pool. You're lying to me. It's good water. You're crazy. You sneaked it out of there while I was asleep. 
You, you tried to make me think it was poison. I ought to shoot you both. All right, Victor, if you're so positive. Go on down and drink out of the pool. Oh, that gives me an idea. I'll just find out if that water's poison. Go drink some of it, Harvey. Certainly not. I'll give you 30 seconds. It's poison, Victor. Go ahead, drink, or I'll shoot. No, don't do it, Harvey. Then supposing you drink some, Donna. Very well, I will. Victor, it'll kill her. Donna, wait. I'll drink it. You're a fool, Victor. But come along. Uh, uh, this is going to be very interesting. Not as much as you think. Get, get off of me, I'll kill you! Mm. Oh. Uh, maybe that'll hold you, Harvey. Oh, Harvey. Uh, I'm all right, Donna. I just did my shoulder. I hope you're satisfied now that it is poison, Victor. Maybe. But you two are getting water from someplace. All right. Hand over that canteen, Donna. Please, Victor. That's for Donna. I'll take care of it for all of us. And if either of you make a move toward me, I'll shoot both of you. Good night. And sleep tight, both of you. The night slowly fades. And the chill of dawn creeps in. Then as the sun comes over the horizon, Harvey stirs fretfully, opens his eyes and looks for Donna. She sits beyond the dead embers of the campfire, her hands folded before her, staring blankly into space. Harvey raises up with a start and moves quickly to her side. Victor is sprawled on his back, the hilt of a hunting knife protruding from his breast. Donna. Donna. Good. What's happened to Victor? He's dead, Harvey. Dead? That knife. Why, it's yours, Donna. Yes, it's mine. Now no one will ever know. Will I, Harvey? No. I had to. I had to. Harvey, hello there. It's Dr. Saunders. Uh, here we are. Oh, thank heavens we found you. Sighted a ship, built a signal fire. They're waiting for us. Well, what's this? Well, Victor must have, uh, must have gone crazy in the night and stabbed himself. Well, let me see. He's dead, Harvey. How'd this happen? I told you, he... He must have uh, stabbed himself. No, he, no, he didn't. I stabbed him. It's my knife. I, I got to thinking, and I did it. I crept over, and I stabbed him. I uh, see. When did you do this, Donna? It was, it was not more than an hour ago. I couldn't help it, Doctor. I, I couldn't help it. Please, Donna. There's nothing to fear. I didn't want anybody to know. Because of Alice. They won't know, Donna. You didn't kill him. What? He's been dead for at least three hours. Oh, what do you mean? Look at his eyes. Look at his lips and his tongue. The swelling of his stomach. Did you test the pool, Harley? Yes. Every pool we've come to has been heavy in mineral content. I warned him, but he thought we were lying to him. Last night, he pulled a gun and took Donna's canteen. There wasn't much in it, but it was all we had. He's been drinking whiskey, so a little water wouldn't satisfy him. So he drank from the pool. Ah, poor Victor. I guess it's just as well. Don't worry, Donna. No one will ever know. Will they, Doctor? There's nothing to tell. Except Victor Jackson poisoned himself in a fit of extreme thirst. <laughs> No, Donna. No one will ever know. You did your best. You tried hard to make things work out. But somehow fate seemed to take things right out of your hands. <laughs> but you know better, don't you, Harvey? You know what happened. Tell us, Harvey. Tell us. After Victor took the canteen from Donna and drank the few swallows in it, he fell off to sleep. Then I took the canteen and filled it from the poison pool. I knew he'd wake up with a greater thirst, and he did. But I'm not sorry. He's better off. And I found I do love Donna. And I'll take care of her for the rest of her days. There you are. From drama to tragedy. From tragedy to a beautiful love story wherein they will live happily ever after. <laughs> 
I know. <laughs> CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler stories are written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originate from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, same time... I, the Whistler, return to tell you the incredible tale of the Secret Seven. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. About a year ago, I began getting tons of notifications about how somebody was trying to log into my social media. I was getting email phishing scams on a daily basis. I was being inundated with email sales pitches from companies I'd never even heard of. I was getting calls and texts from those same companies. I was listening to a podcast that talked about Incogni, short for incognito, and I thought I'd give it a try. For the past year, Incogni has reduced the number of email and spam calls and texts that I receive, it's helped to protect my identity from hackers, and helps keep my data safe. Over the past year, Incogni has successfully removed my personal information from over 200 different data brokerage sites, and I get regular updates on how many are still in progress, how many have been successfully completed, and how many requests were sent out to remove my personal information. It would have taken me over 160 hours to do all of this, and nobody has time or patience for that. Fortunately, it's all taken care of by Incogni. I live online, personally and professionally, and I trust Incogni to help me live with a lot less worry. You can give Incogni a try right now by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. That's short for incognito. I-N-C-O-G-N-I. WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. Strange Wills. Stories of Strange Wills made by strange people. Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William. And featuring Marvin Miller and Lorreen Tuttle with Howard Culver. And the original music of Del Castillo. I devise and bequeath to my heirs the seven deadly sins. Envy. Hate, jealousy, greed, anger, despair, and revenge. And here is Warren William. These are the stories of actual wills made under strange circumstances, often by strange people, who, frustrated in life, seek this means of self-expression to reach back from the grave to satisfy their secret passions or to seek the victory of a bitter revenge. Names, places, and time have been changed so that no reflection can fall on any person living or dead. Only the last will and testament remains like a living monument to the eternal ego of man. You'll presently see what I mean, but first, I'd like you to hear a message from your announcer.
now back to Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in Alias Dr. Svengali. This is the story of a strange triangle. The sordid story of a man who saw his young and beautiful wife slowly fall under the spell of a mad and evil genius who covered his sinister acts under the guise of psychiatry. In his last will and testament, Philip Martin, on his deathbed, sought revenge against the person or persons he thought responsible for his murder. I remember it all began on a lovely spring morning. Everyone should have been at peace with the world, but... Uh... Mr. O'Connell speaking. Mr. O'Connell, this is Mrs. Marilyn Martin, the wife of Philip Martin. Oh, yes, Mrs. Martin. How are you? Oh, Mr. O'Connell, something dreadful has happened. Philip has had a horrible accident. Oh, I'm sorry. He's here at the Good Samaritan Hospital. He keeps asking for you. Can you come over, Mr. O'Connell? Of course. I leave at once. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'll be waiting in the lobby for you. But hurry, Mr. O'Connell. Please hurry. I'll be there as soon as possible, Mrs. Martin. As I drove to the hospital, I wondered what had happened to Philip Martin. I'd seen him on several occasions at different affairs. His reputation had always been excellent, and he had amassed a considerable fortune in the importing business. I remembered, too, that he had married within the last few years, and rumor had it that it was an ideal match. Well, I would soon know. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Martin. Tell me what happened. Philip is dying. Early this morning while I was sleeping, I had a dreadful premonition that he was in mortal danger. I ran to his room just in time. Oh, Mr. O'Connell was horrible. What did you see, Marilyn? Well, just as I got to the door, I saw him fall off the balcony. Fall five floors to certain death. There, there, Marilyn. <laughs> it must have been a horrible shock. I love him so much, Mr. O'Connell. So much. Why did he do it? There was no reason. I'll go up and see him immediately, Marilyn. Uh, oh, tell me, is he is he conscious? Yes. And he keeps calling for you. They won't let me in his room. He doesn't want to see me, his own wife. I can't understand it. Wait for me here, Marilyn, and I'll talk to Philip. I'll send for you later. But at the deathbed of Philip Martin, I heard a most unusual and amazing story. I, I tell you, John, I did not jump off the balcony purposely. It was, it was her voice that, that made me do it. She wanted to get rid of me. No, no, take it easy, Philip. What do you mean? Uh, they, they wanted to get rid of me. I know it. I know it. Who are they, Philip? Marilyn, my wife, and and that doctor she's been seeing, that, uh, that psychiatrist. Please, Philip, please, start from the beginning. La last night, last night when I was sleeping. Philip, Philip. Do you hear me, Philip? Mm, I, I, I hear you. Philip, I'm calling you, calling you. Follow me, Philip. Follow, follow. Huh? Uh, where, where are you? Walk to the balcony, Philip. To the balcony. Huh? Marilyn, is it you? Open the door, Philip. Open the door. Mm. Marilyn? Where are you? Walk out, Philip. Walk out here. I'm waiting for you, Philip. Waiting. Waiting. John, it, it, it was...
was Marilyn's voice I heard that, that drew me out to the balcony. But I, I fooled him. I, I didn't die. I've, I've lived long enough to change my will, to revenge myself, John. Here. I took the piece of paper he handed me. It was the last will and testament of Philip Martin, laboriously written as he lay dying. In it, he had made the most serious accusations against his wife. He had set up a trust, naming me as executor, which limited Marilyn Martin to a nominal monthly allowance. Time was of the essence, so I hurriedly called in two nurses to sign as subscribing witnesses, and the last will and testament of Philip Martin, in which he named his wife as his murderer, was signed just minutes before he died. That night, alone in my study, I looked over the will and reviewed my conversation with the late Philip Martin. Were his accusations true? Was his wife guilty of his murder? Well, there was only one way to find out. I called upon Mrs. Martin. Her exquisite beauty was still visible in spite of the tragic lines the events of the last few hours had etched on her face. That she was suffering from some deep emotional strain was obvious. As I looked at her, I found it hard to believe that she was the heartless murderer her husband believed her to be. Please be seated, Mr. O'Connell. Thank you. I promise I won't keep you a moment longer than is absolutely necessary. But there are a few facts I must know before I file your husband's will. I shall be glad to help you in any way I can. Mrs. Martin, your husband died believing that you were the cause of his death. Oh, no. And that you had an accomplice. Unless you can be cleared of these accusations, which Philip Martin made against you on his deathbed, you may be accused of his murder. Murder? I... Murder? Surely you don't believe me. He swore it was your voice that led him to the balcony, Marilyn. A deathbed statement of this nature cannot be taken lightly. My voice? My voice led him to the balcony? Oh, no. No, I loved him. Why should I destroy him? Frankly, I don't know. But for your sake, I've got to find out, and quickly, before Philip's will is filed for probate. Marilyn, I'm going to ask you one question. I want it answered honestly and truthfully. Are you in love with a certain doctor... A psychiatrist you've been seeing lately? In love with Dr. Cosmo. Oh, nothing has been further from my mind or my heart. Believe me, Mr. O'Connell. Your husband sincerely believed that you and this, this Dr. Cosmo conspired with malice of forethought to kill him. Oh, how horrible. Nothing is further from the truth. He, he did attempt to... But let me tell you the whole story. Perhaps then you'll understand about three months ago, I saw him for the first time. I was nervous, troubled at the time. Someone told me his methods were unusual, but effective. So, on the spur of the moment, I went to his office. You will please come in, Mrs. Martin. Oh. <laughs> This room, it's so weird. Oh, no, not at all, Mrs. Martin. When you understand it, it is my laboratory. It's so unusual, it, it's so... You will find, Mrs. Martin, that in this room one sheds inhibitions, fears, and complexes. But why such strange things in the room? Everything has its purpose, Mrs. Martin. These purple drapes, an outlet for your hidden emotions... The marble bust of the Madonna and the golden votive lamp offer release to the religious complex inborn in every human heart. The marble couch, here one rests while the mind journeys to the realm of peace eternal. And the music? Well, you will learn that music, properly applied in conjunction with hypnosis, recreates a new life. Yes, it will open for you a beautiful new world that you will not forsake, my dear Mrs. Martin. A world that will bring peace to your troubled mind. Everything you say sounds logical, I guess. Perhaps necessary. And yet, it makes me shiver. Oh, please do not be frightened. 
There is no need for alarm, I assure you. You are about to become a living part of a great miracle, one that you will never forget as long as you live. And now, if you are ready... Of course. What must I do? Lie down, please, here on this marble couch. Like this? Yes. Now, place your arms straight down alongside your body. So... Mm. Directly in line with your vision, you see a clock. See how the pendulum swings back and forth. Back and forth. Back and forth. As I play the organ, you will watch the pendulum closely. Do not take your eyes from it, even for a moment. Yes, Doctor. You are the evening star. You are the scent of jasmine, of frankincense and myrrh in the chalice of love. Your mind, your every thought shall be attuned to the unselfish love of the master. Open the door of your subconscious mind that I may enter. For I am truth. I am light. I am love. Your eyes are closed. You are asleep. Tell me, whom do you see? I see only the master of truth, of light, of love. Your ears are sealed to earthly sounds. What then do you hear? I hear only... The thoughts of the master. Then arise and go. For I shall speak to you across the deathless void. And you shall answer me. Yes, you shall answer me. After that, I called on him once or twice a week. Then gradually I noticed that he was becoming more attentive. Though I'd given him no cause, really. I knew he was in love with me, and I realized, too late, that our association must end. I saw him for the last time the day before Philip... The day before Philip died. He had been playing for me. Do not try to evade the issue, Marilyn. I love you. I have loved you from the moment you entered my office. You can't escape me, you know that. I can't come here again, Dr. Cosmo. You know that I'm married, and I love my husband. Then I shall destroy him. I shall destroy anyone or anything that stands between us. You shall see. You shall see. We will continue with alias Dr. Svengali in just a moment. But first, a word from our sponsor.
And now back to Alias Dr. Svengali, starring Warren William. Later that night, I called upon Marilyn Martin. She told me of the threat Dr. Cosmo had made against the life of her husband, of how he was able to communicate with her through her subconscious mind. Her confession left me with no alternative. Early the next afternoon, I called Dr. Cosmo. This is Dr. Cosmo speaking. Dr. Cosmo, this is John Francis O'Connell, attorney at law. As you may know, I represent the estate of the late Philip Martin. How does that concern me, Mr. O'Connell? I think you'll better understand, Doctor, when I speak to you personally. Shall we make it, say, at eight tonight? I would prefer to make it at ten, Mr. O'Connell. Then I shall be at liberty for as long as you like. Ten o'clock, then, Doctor. I will be here. I wondered what the expected meeting with Dr. Gregory Cosmo would lead to. My evidence against this man was purely circumstantial. Just what had he actually done? Who would believe him capable of directing his thoughts through the subconscious mind of a second party, Marilyn, and will her to lure her husband to his death? Yet I knew that in this man lay the key to the strange mystery surrounding the death of Philip Martin. Was the man mad? I expected anything to happen. At exactly one minute to ten. Come in, Mr. O'Connell. Thank you, Doctor. I'm taking the liberty of locking the door so we won't be disturbed. Come this way, please. We shall go directly into my private laboratory. You will perhaps find my laboratory a bit unusual, Mr. O'Connell. It is arranged for the development of advanced thought in modern psychiatry and hypnosis. The Madonna, the golden votive lamp, marble couch, yes. Everything is here just as she described it to me. You are referring to Mrs. Martin, I believe. Eh? Why, uh, yes, Doctor. <laughs> Uh, she is one of the most beautiful women who have ever come to my office for help, Mr. O'Connell. Won't you sit down here, please? Here, facing the organ. I shall play for you as we talk. I find music very soothing to the body as well as to the mind. You are surprised, are you not, to see that my methods of advanced psychiatry call for such an unusual setting? Quite frankly, Dr. Cosmo, nothing you do surprises me. I acknowledge you to be the master craftsman you are of psychiatry. But when psychiatry leads to murder... (laughs) Murder? What do you mean? Dr. Cosmo, there's not the slightest doubt in my mind but that you are directly responsible for the death of Philip Martin. And if you like, I'll tell you exactly how you brought it about. Please do, Mr. O'Connell. You flatter my capabilities, but I shall find your story interesting nonetheless. There must always be a motive for murder, Doctor. And you had not one, but two. You were in love with Marilyn Martin. And secondly, you are greedy for the money you thought would be hers at her husband's death. Shall I proceed? Oh, yes, yes. Go on, please. I find it very interesting, very entertaining. You kept Marilyn Martin under a continual state of hypnosis. That's not new, of course. English psychiatrists have done that for many years in cases of advanced neurosis. But in any event, her mind became in actuality your mind. Your thoughts became her thoughts because in some nefarious way, you were able to implant them in her subconscious mind. Then you finally decided to go all the way. You were in love with Marilyn. You wanted to possess her more than anything on this earth. So you decided to do away with her husband. You figured out that if you could direct your thoughts into her subconscious mind, why couldn't she transmit these thoughts to the sleeping mind of a third person? In this case, her husband. You tried it and your experiment was successful. Through the mind of Marilyn Martin, you, Dr. Cosmo became the voice that drove Philip Martin to the suicide. Go on, Mr. O'Connor. 
I I charge you, Dr. Cosmo, with the... with the... <laughs> you can't move, can you, Mr. O'Connell? You have lost your power of speech, the physical faculties of motion. You sit there like a statue. You are a statue, because I have willed it, yes. Mr. O'Connell, you are right. I was the voice. I deliberately and intentionally planned the destruction of Philip Martin, because he stood in my way just as you are now doing. I love Marilyn. I love her beyond anything this world can offer. I shall have her, too. I am the first to have successfully transmitted thought through the subconscious to a third person. The mind, Mr. O'Connell, just like atomic energy, is on the threshold of great discoveries. Its potentialities are unlimited. If I can send one person to his death, why not many, why not entire nations? The million dollars, ah, is nothing to the money and power I shall have. With my knowledge, Mr. O'Connell, I can rule destiny and the world. Now I shall give you a practical demonstration of my power. But you will not believe to tell about it. My music, the pendulum before your eyes, which you are watching subconsciously, my power of concentration have hypnotized you. Now I am going to send a new thought to your subconscious mind, Mr. O'Connell. And you will act upon it. Walk, walk to the desk. Walk to the desk. Open the drawer. O open, open the... Take out the gun. Take out the gun. Place the forehead. Place gun to forehead. 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 I stopped him just in time, Mr. O'Connell. Just in time. Oh, Marilyn, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm dizzy. Here. Here, let me help you. Sit down for a moment. There's nothing to worry about. Dr. Cosmo was dead. I... I shot him. But I... Uh, I don't understand. I couldn't rest thinking about you being here alone with him. I knew you were in danger because I alone know what his evil capabilities are. So I drove over, came in through the basement door and hid behind the curtains. I was here hiding when he brought you into this room. And you saw it all then? I heard. I, I saw everything. When he began his hypnotic music, I recognized the chords. He used the same strain to put me to sleep. I put my fingers to my ears to keep out the sound. Through the curtains, I saw you walk to the desk, open the drawer, take out the gun, and and place it to your temple. And then I... I shot. I shot. And with that shot, you not only avenged the death of your husband, Marilyn, but you ended the career of this monster of evil, Gregory Cosmo, alias Dr. Svengali. Let his memory remain as a lesson to all future Svengalis that human rights cannot be usurped or violated to further their mad plans and aspirations. Warren William will be back in just a moment to tell you what the official records say about the probate cause of alias Dr. Svengali. But first... A word from our sponsor. again is Warren William. A coroner's jury completely exonerated Marilyn Martin of all responsibility of the death of Dr. Gregory Cosmo. 
The last will and testament of Philip Martin was duly admitted to probate, and Mrs. Martin is receiving the full benefits of the trust estate set up for her under the terms of the will. Thinking back, as I often do, upon the strange life and career of Dr. Cosmo, the question frequently arises in my mind as to where genius ends and madness begins. For this man was a genius in an evil sort of way. He was one of the first to realize the potential greatness of the human mind. It's too bad, isn't it, that he, he couldn't have directed his research along lines that would have helped humanity instead of trying to destroy it. I wonder where the answer lies. I wonder. Next week, I shall tell you the strange story of a man who hated his son with an intensity beyond human reasoning or understanding. Not content with cutting him off in his will with one dollar, he reached out from the depths of his grave in a sinister effort to utterly destroy him. Did he succeed? <laughs> Well, for the answer, I invite you to listen in next week to this amazing story about a last will and a testament. It's called Black Interlude. saying goodbye. Until next week. Strange Wills is written by Ken Crippine and directed by Albert Ulrich. This is a Telaways feature produced in Hollywood. technology isn't just for the living anymore. When the dead want to make contact, they will use any means. Radio, TV, mobile phones, cars, you name it. The other side just won't be quiet, and technology often helps make their presence felt. Whether it's a last goodbye from a loved one, a warning from beyond the veil, or just making sure we know they are still there, ghosts in the machines Scary True Stories of the Paranormal by G. Michael Vasey tells how ghosts, demons, and the dead use our own technology to communicate with us, using true and often creepy stories from people just like you. Ghosts in the Machines – Scary True Stories of the Paranormal by G. Michael Vasey Narrated by Darren Marlar Here are a free sample of this audiobook on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Bring you the witch's tale, written and produced by Alonzo Dean Cole.
And now, let us join old Nancy, witch of Salem, and Satan, her wise black cat. <laughs> Hunger and three year old I be today. Yes, sir, Hunger and three year old. Satan. If these folks want to hear another of our pretty little bedtime stories, you just tell them to douse out them lights so's we'll have it nice and dark. Now draw up to the fire and gaze into embers. Gaze into them deep, and soon you'll be down south with us in old Louisiana. <laughs> It's strange country down there, ghost country. And outside a little railway depot there begins our young, thou graveyard mansion. <laughs> graveyard mansion. <laughs> Good heavens, driver. We're strangers here. Just got off that train. You can't expect us to walk a distance you say is three miles at this time of night. Or rather morning. We'd be lost among your cane break and bayous before we got halfway. I'm powerful sorry, gentlemen, but I, I wouldn't drive you to the old Tate Rose Plantation house at night for all the money in the New Orleans Mint. And neither will anyone else in these here parts. Why not? What's wrong with the Ted Gross place? What you all want to go out there for? Well, if it really makes any difference to you, we've just inherited the plantation. We're down here to take possession. Your name's Blanchard, then? Yes. Yeah, I heard your two brothers was expected. Your lawyers had men from Barton Rouge this past week fixing the house up. They was glad to get away this morning after only spending daytime there. Say, will you please tell us exactly what you're driving at? Just this. If you gentlemen are wise, you'll take the first train back up north and forget that Tate Ghost Place was ever left you. That old house ain't been lived in for nine hundred years for good reason. Folks here yeah, call it Graveyard Mansion, because it's a house of the living dead. What? That's all I know, gentlemen. Good night. Hey, come back here. Wait a minute. Well, I'll be doggone. <laughs> Drove off and left his flat. He didn't even want to stay and talk about the place, Kurt. <laughs> Look, Al. It looks as though we've inherited a haunted house. Well, our attorney never mentioned such thing in his letters. Well, he's an educated man. You don't think he'd write us as such a crazy idea as that? Come on. We'd better start walking. Walk? To Tate Gross tonight? We haven't any choice. That chap is the only taxi man. There are no hotels in this little village. Uh, let's go back to the depot. We'll get directions from the station master and see if we can buy a lantern. All right. <laughs> that chump said... Our new home is called Graveyard Mansion. <laughs> yes, because it's the house of the living dead. <laughs> Poor superstitious idiot. <laughs> Imagine believing in ghosts in this 20th century. <laughs> How can people be so dumb? There's the marker they told us to look for, Kurt. The house must be just beyond those trees. I hope it is. I'm tired. Yeah, so am I. This hike has taken longer than we expected. It must be nearly dawn. Yes. It's Louisiana is eerie country at night. Ghastly Spanish moss hanging from the trees seems to writhe like something living. Mm, and those clouds of mist that rise from the bayous take strange shapes. Half-human shapes. Sort of puts one in the mood to almost believe in... And ghosts. Mm -hmm. What if we didn't have good sense? <laughs> wonder what it is these people fear about our new property. That old Creole who sold us the lantern was more insistent than the cab driver that we make no attempt to live in the place. Without being any more explicit as to reason. Yeah, he seemed either afraid or ashamed to make any real explanation. But like the other chap, he said it was a house of the living dead. Mm, that doesn't make sense even for a ghost story. Oh, it's just a lot of bunk. Well, if the tales are in bunk, we'll soon find out. Look. Huh. We've arrived. Kind of a spooky-looking old place at that. It's different than I pictured it. Sort of like a French chateau. Our ancestor who built it was married to a Frenchwoman. She was probably responsible for its design. Let's go in. Uh, wait. 
Kurt, look there. Those tombstones. A little burial ground. Maybe that's why they call the house Graveyard Mansion. That's what I was thinking. Come on. Uh, Wait a minute. Does it seem to you there's something moving in the darkness beyond those tombstones? Something white? Yes. Oh, some of that ghastly mist that rises from the bayous. I, I, I suppose so. It, it looked almost like a woman. Well, let's go inside the house and get some sleep before we become as goofy as the natives we've talked to. Hold this lantern while I find the keys that lawyer sent us. His men didn't fix the place up very well. There's a broken window. I see. Here we are. Phew. Black as a coal mine in here. What was that? Oh, bats. Place is full of them. Oh. Wish I could find a lamp. That lantern isn't much good. No, its light doesn't seem to penetrate this darkness at all. It's almost a non-natural darkness. Yes. It's funny. The ventilation from that broken window it ought to smell sweet in here. It's a nerfy odor about the place, like a... like a tomb. What's that? Door slam. Curtis! Down that hallway. A woman! <laughs> that laugh! Well, she's no figure of the mist. I'll soon find out who that is. Come on. Well, she's disappeared around the corner. She went through that little door. Help me. Yes. There it is. It's stuck. All right. I've uh, got it. Uh, it leads to the cellar. There she goes, down those stairs. Hey, stop you. Who are you? She doesn't even look around. After her. Hold up that ladder now. Let her... Oh, the oh. bat's knocked it from my hand. We're in the dark. With her. <laughs> that laugh again. Hold on to your nerve. I've got matches. Well, give me a light, for God's sake, light. Here. Oh, thank God. The lantern isn't broken. Oh, light it, quick. I have it. Now we'll see what... The woman's gone. The cellar's empty. Where does she go to? This isn't a true cellar. It's just a little vault. There's no way out save by these stairs. She couldn't have passed us. They're too narrow. The vault is bare. No place in which to hide. Curtis, what's that set up in the wall? Why, it's... Burial crypt. A burial crypt? A tomb! <laughs> That's Helen. where that woman hid! Helen, hold on to yourself! Here, don't let your nerves go like that! Helen, our senses have been fooled! Those stories we heard, these ghastly myths we, 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 we've seen have made us imagine things that can't be true! We haven't seen any woman, there's been no woman here to see! Ah, uh, but we heard her laugh! Oh, we only thought we did! Our imaginations have played us tricks, I tell you! Alan! Alan! Uh, you, you must be right. Of course I'm right. It's the only explanation. There, there's an inscription on that tomb. What? What does it say? I'll see. It reads, Here lies Antoinette de Moray, wife of Adrian Blanchard, born 1782, died 1804. 130 years ago. Antoinette de Moray. She's the woman this mansion was built for. Yes, I... Remember her name now. Come, let's get out of this cellar. Wait. That's funny. What? It's cold as death down here, but this slab is warm. Feel it. Yes. It's warm as life. The rooster crowed. That means it's dawn. Let's get out of this cellar where I can see the light of day. Go ahead. I'll follow. Julia. Now the slab is growing cold. But, Alan, I've told you a thousand times that everything we thought we saw and heard and felt last night was pure imagination. Well, that's simple common sense. I know it is. And I've honestly agreed with you all day. But ever since the sun went down, I... Oh, I realize I'm acting like a baby Kurt, but this place has got my goat. <laughs> You'll soon get over that. Cold shivers ran up and down my spine for hours after we came out of that infernal burial vault this morning. But now that I've had a little sleep, I feel honestly cheerful about our inheritance. Why? Why do you suppose that single tomb is in the cellar when there's a graveyard just outside? Oh, I don't know. Oh, Lord, I forgot to show you. Alan, look what I found in the attic. A miniature portrait. What a beautiful woman. Look at the back. It's engraved to Adrian from Antoinette. Uh Uh-huh. It's Our Lady of the Tomb. Wasn't she a knockout? She must have been lovely. Our great-great-uncle must have been mad about her. 
That's probably why she's buried away from the common herd. Poor thing. She was only 22 years old when she died. A branch of the family still lives down here. Wonder if we have any female cousins who've inherited her good looks. <laughs> we can find one. I'll bet you'll have no more objections to living in this house. Oh, you and I are going to be crazy about this place. Look out this window at that neglected land we're going to put in shape. Look at those great trees and that bayou shining in the moonlight. And those old tombstones in the yard. It's nearly midnight when they say the dead return to life. Now, if you're going to start that again, I'm going to bed. You better turn in yourself. It is midnight. Yes. Just midnight. Kurt, did you hear that door? The wind must have slammed it shut. It may be the door from that cellar. Now stop that. You're not going to pieces on me again. Kurt, look out this window. The woman whom we saw last night. Good Lord. She won't get away from me this time. Where are you going? After her. Wait, wait, don't leave me. Wait, Kurt, don't go near her. Let me go. No, no. Alan. She's turning back. She's coming toward us. Run. She's something awful from the grave. I won't believe that. Let me go. That laugh. Same we heard last night. Run, I tell you, run. She's something risen from the dead. Lord, help me. I believe you're right. Come on. Run, run. Wait. She's calling to us. Yeah, there's, there's nothing dead about that voice. Look at her coming there. A healthy-looking flesh and blood girl. <laughs> she, she's laughing at us. Can you blame her? Of all the dumb, benighted saps, yes, we are. Yes, we certainly are. Curtis, what's the matter now? Look at her. She's the image of that miniature you found. Sure. Living image of a woman who's been dead a hundred years. <laughs> Gentlemen, if you permit, I take the liberty of introduce myself. <laughs> Satan. If these folks come see us next time old Nancy has a birthday, she tell them some more about graveyard mansions. <laughs> the house of the living dead. <laughs> Tale, written and produced by Alonzo Dean Cole.
And now, let us join old Nancy, witch of Salem, and Satan, her wise black cat. <laughs> Hannah and ten year old I be today. Yes, sir. Hannah and ten year old. Satan. Yeah. Old Nancy feels so good this evening. She's going to get right down to business and cheer folks up with spinning the finish of that comforting little yarn we begun last time they was here. Douse out them lights so's we'll have it dark and cozy. We told how them two young brothers from up north went down to Louisiana to claim a fine big mansion they'd inherited, which folks call the House of the Living Dead. But our brothers didn't pay no attention to that kind of talk <laughs> till they got out to the place and seed a ghostly figure which seemed to disappear in a tomb down cellar on which was the name of a French woman who'd been dead a hundred year. Then, next night, they saw what appeared to be the same ghostly figure out on the grounds, and they was about to run away from it when they see it, it was really a living, breathing girl. <laughs> a living girl who was the image of the woman who was buried in that tomb. That's why we left off, draw up to the fire and gaze into the embers, gaze into them deep and hear the finish of our yarn. About graveyard mansion. <laughs> graveyard mansion. <laughs> you two gentlemen acted so afraid. When you saw me coming toward you, you must have think I am a ghost. No words can express my humiliation for the childish way we acted. We're terribly ashamed. But we'd heard so many weird tales about our new estate, and, well, we didn't think any living person would venture on these grounds at night. I come often when the moon is full like this and wander here while others sleep. This the place I've been so long deserted. I have come to look upon it as my own. Oh, but now that you are here, I must not trespass any more. Please don't feel that way about oh, it. I should say not. Look upon this place as still your oh, own. Thank you. Perhaps I shall. And now I must say au revoir. May we see you home? Oh, thank you very much, but I must go alone. Before you go, may we know your name? Oh, I had forgotten. I am Miss Nettie Blanchard. Blanchard? Well, that's our name, too. Oh, so, we are distant relatives, maybe. A good night. We shall see you again. Uh, oh, we, you will see me again. Good night. Good night. Good night. Isn't she a beauty? Absolute knockout. Kurt, let me see that miniature again of the lady of the tomb. Here. The resemblance is startling, isn't it? The girl who just left here might have sat for this portrait. Alan. She said her name was Nettie. That's a contraction of Antoinette. Antoinette was the name of the... the woman of this portrait. Coincidence, isn't it? Yes. Coincidence. Oh, come on. Let's go to bed. Alan, Alan, wake up. Are you going to sleep all day? Huh? Well, it's morning. Time to rise and shine. Oh, I... I was dreaming. It must have been a pleasant dream. You certainly didn't want to snap out of it. I... I dreamed that girl, the one we met last night, came into this room and kissed me. Oh, that sounds nice. Get up. We have a lot of work to do. Right away. Queer. I feel weak as a kitten. Huh. You don't look any too good. I have a... Funny pain. Where? 
Here, on my throat. There's a little mark there. As though you'd been bitten. Funny. That's where I dreamed she kissed me. The house is just beyond that next turn in the road, Doctor. Turn your car to the left. Turn the way. <clears throat> you say it is just a week since you uh, noticed the first indication of your brother's illness? Yes. I wouldn't have believed anyone could waste away so suddenly. He looks as though every drop of blood were being drained from his body. You should have come for me sooner. Oh, I wanted to. But he and Miss Blanchard insisted there was nothing really the matter with him. Please, Miss Blanchard, a relative, of course. A very distant one. We only met her since we came down here. She's with my brother now. When he recovers, they... They're going to be married. They became engaged on very short acquaintance. Yes. There's the house just ahead. I know. I know Graveyard Mansion very well. Now, this strange mark you mentioned on your brother's throat, you say it have become more inflamed each day? Yes. It's as though the fangs of some beast had entered there. The house was full of bats when we arrived, Doctor. I've heard of vampire bats. Do you suppose... No, I do not believe your brother is the victim of a vampire bat. Here we are. Oh, there's <laughs> Miss Blanchard at the door. Nettie, is Alan all right? I brought the doctor. The doctor come too late. What do you mean? Not that Alan... Your brother is dead. No. No. Graveyard Mansion. Graveyard Mansion. Oh. Come away from that window, son. There's no way for us to bring your brother back. No. He's buried in that little graveyard now. The doctor, what killed him? What caused that awful mark upon his throat? What drained the blood from his body? What? As yet, I will know it was nothing recognized by natural science. But science refuses to recognize many things it should endeavor to know and explain. But never mind that matter. Your brother's fiancée, Miss Blanchard, she was not at the funeral this afternoon. Because she couldn't bear to see him lying in his coffin. You heard her say last night... We, I heard her excuse. You have never seen this girl except at night? Oh, I know, but the reason I is... I have also heard her excuse for that. I thought I knew by sight every soul in this parish, yet I have never seen that girl until the night you brought me here. Oh, you don't mean to imply that she had anything to do with Alan's death? I imply nothing. But it is midnight. In time for Miss Blanchard's promised call. I am most anxious to improve her acquaintance. I see her coming beyond those gravestones. Isn't she beautiful? You love that woman. Doctor. You love her as your brother did. Yes. While Alan lived, I denied it even to myself. But now I... Doctor, it's as though she's cast a spell upon me. She's so beautiful. And so like the miniature you showed me, a woman dead a hundred years. Why do you torture me with these awful questions? These frightful doubts? Why is she so like a woman dead a hundred years? Why does she only appear at midnight? Why don't she tell me where she lives? Why? Go and meet her. She's almost at the door. We may find an answer to our questions. At the dawn! I never see such a superstitious man of medicine, Dr. Brochard. The way you talk, you have me almost believe in ghosts. I believe in ghosts, Mademoiselle Blanchard, in ghosts and vampires. Vampires, Doctor? Uh, such talk is foolish. No people now accept such things. Because the thought is too fearful for men's mind to dwell upon, perhaps. Have you heard what vampires are, Miss Blanchard? Oh, some other time, you tell me. Uh, Curtis, I must be going now. Mademoiselle oh. will find the explanation very interesting. Vampires are those evil spirits sometimes called the dead alive. It is said they rise from their graves at midnight, clothed in human flesh, kept whole by blood drained from living but bodies. Very interesting, but I must be going. But you have not heard yet all. At midnight, the vampire can rise, mademoiselle, but it must return to its grave at dawn. Yes, yes, but I must be leaving now. Of course, it is very late, or rather early. Dawn is here. Doctor, what are you driving at? I believe at? in vampires, my boy, and dangers of the darkness, since Miss Blanchard will not permit you or me to see her home 
I suggest you wait. We us till daylight come for our protection. You keep me here with Doc. I must be home. But a few minutes can make very little difference. And Dawn is nearly here. Move from that door and let me pass. You're as anxious to reach your home as the vampire is to reach his tomb. You Doctor. You are insulting. No, I am accusing. Dr. Brochard. Accusing the fiend to kill your brother. Accusing the evil soul of Graveyard Mansion. Stand from that door and let me pass. No. Let me pass, I, I say. not hear you. Dawn is coming light. The rubs fiends of the power darkness lent them. Look, the vestments of dawn shine in his sky. No, let pass! Doctor, you're mad. Stand aside and let her go. Oh, no, she's a normal woman, not a vile undead. Let her remain within this room one minute more. I cannot. I am late. 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 Mary. She's turned around. Ran the other way. After her. She's going to the cellar. I know she would. Quick, and you will see the truth. No! Dawn. She's one home. I won't believe. You shall have proof. What are you going to do? Open the tomb of Antoinette, who has been dead a hundred years. This is sacrilege. We have no right to violate a tomb. The dead. dead deserve no mercy from either God or man. Such things as vampires can't exist. Mm, well, I, I finished my labor. Help me lift this coffin lid as you shall see. Oh, I must have proof. <laughs> Antoinette Blanchard has been dead a hundred years. We shall find nothing but dust. Help me lift the lid. The girl I love can't be in that coffin. Help me lift the lid. I... I will. Regard, there is your proof. Antoinette. Yes, of tonight and of a hundred years ago, the same. Preserved in evil life by the blood of your brother and of others. So has this house gained its name of Graveyard Mansion. But there is a way to end the vampire. This sharpened wooden stake. Above her undead art, I place it. And I drive it home. <gasps> She screamed. Body has crumbled into dust before my eyes. The vampire is no more. The living dead is dead forever. She's gone. She and my brother. All that I love. But the world has lost a scourge. And now Graveyard Mansion is nothing but a name. That's the end of it, on Satan. You folks come see old Nancy next time she has a birthday. Your mother has sadly passed away, and the responsibility of planning a funeral has landed squarely on your shoulders. Sorry. So who do you send the funeral announcements to? Family, of course. Close friends, maybe people who were co-workers with your mom, some of her high school friends perhaps, the Grim Reaper, church family. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Go back. The, the Grim Reaper? Somebody actually requested that for their own funeral. 
And that's the subject of this week's Mind of Marlar, which you can find at mindofmarlar.com. In just a moment, X minus one, but first, who is the greatest detective of them all? The answer's easy. Sherlock Holmes, the immortal character created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And later tonight, NBC brings you one of the infallible Sherlock's most baffling mysteries, the case of the dying detective. Starring in this exciting half hour will be two of England's finest actors, Joe John Gilgood as Holmes, Sir Ralph Richardson as the loyal Dr. Watson. Tonight and every Sunday night, meet the greatest detective of them all as NBC presents The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. Countdown for blastoff. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one. Fire! From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years. On a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X minus one. Tonight's story, Mars is Heaven. When the first space rocket lands on Mars, what will we find? Only the ruins of a dead and deserted planet? Or will there be life, intelligent life in some strange form that we can only imagine? Will we be welcomed with open arms? Or will the Martians treat us as invaders? Only one thing is certain. Someday, a giant metal ship will take off from Earth to travel through the black velocities, the silent gulfs of space, to descend at last into the darkness of the upper Martian atmospheres. And on that day, man will finally know the answers, the day we first land on Mars. Now I hear this. Now hear this. Approaching critical deceleration. Fasten gravity suits. Stand by to land. There it is. We've intersected the course vector, sir. All right, Mr. Lustig. Over to manual control. Aye, sir. Masters, sound general quarters. Aye, sir. Mr. Lustig, what do you make of the terrain? There seems to be a heavy ground, Miss Captain. We won't be able to use the infrared lights. And we'll have to come in on radar. Isn't that a little risky, sir? Landing in the dark? I'd rather run the danger of a blind landing, Lieutenant, than come in without the cover of darkness. Remember, we don't know what kind of reception is waiting for us down there. Airspeed 500. Altitude now 4,000. Bridge to engine room. Stand by for deceleration. Fire forward tubes one and three. Steady as she goes, Mr. Lustig. As she goes, sir. Airspeed 100. Altitude 1,000. Radar indicates a level stretch dead ahead, sir. Skids down. Skids check. Altitude 500. 4. 350. 3. Up a point now. All right. Let's set her down. Power. Masters, pipe battle stations. I said, all secured, sir. Well, gentlemen, gentlemen, we're now on Mars, April 20th, 1987. For 
33, Greenwich time. Enter that in the log, masters. Aye, sir. Well, gentlemen, it's less than two hours till dawn. As soon as it's light, we'll send out a landing party. Masters, get me an all-over hookup. We're all set, Captain. Now hear this. All right, men. The smoking lamp is lit. Well, we're on Mars. The first man shipped from Earth to land here. We don't know what we're going to find or what dangers that we may face. We're 17 men on an alien world. And it's up to us whether we ever get home again. The next few hours should tell the story. And I want instant obedience to all commands. I'll court-martial the first man who doesn't jump to when he's ordered. And one other thing. We may be on Mars, but this is still a United States naval vessel. Officers will conduct a personal and weapons inspection in one hour. That's all. Inspection, Captain. Now? Mr. Lustig, we've got an hour and a half to sweat out before we find out what's outside that airlock. I'd rather have a man worried about his stripes than about what's waiting outside on Mars. Now hear this. Landing party report to forward airlock. Captain Black, Lieutenant Hingston, Lieutenant Lustig, and Dr. Horst. Report immediately to forward airlock. It's now landing time, minus five. Well, they're paging us. Uh, you ready, Dr. Horst? Yes, Mr. Lustig. As ready as I will ever be. Well, come on, let's get in the lock. <clears throat> Inkson, Lustig, and Horst reporting in the airlock. Very well, sir. The captain will join you. Four minutes to go. At least the captain would get here. What difference does it make? I just want to get it over with, that's all. Anybody got a cigarette? Yeah, I think you're smoking too much, Lieutenant Lustig. Are you nervous? I are for your horse. Wondering what's hidden outside underneath that ground mist? I've been giving it some thought. It'll be very interesting to find out. A very unusual planet, Mars. Why? It has an atmosphere. A wonderful thing, an atmosphere. Where you find one, you... Uh, Find light. You mean Martians? What do you think they'll look like? Who knows? Intelligent life can take many forms. You mean they may have green skins and eyes on stalks or something? The comic book conception is possible, of course. Or they may have developed to a point that is far beyond us. Perhaps they have a science that can produce weapons far more dangerous than our atomic missiles. You think we may have to fight our way up? After all... We are invaders. Now I hear this. Landing time minus two. All right, all right. We heard this. You know what I'd like to find outside that airlock? Good old Illinois. Ever been there, Lustig? Uh, only Chicago. You ought to see my hometown. Green lawns, big white houses. <laughs> Sounds like my hometown. My grandmother used to have one of those iron deer on the lawn. Every Halloween, we'd paint it another color. One time, we painted it black and white like a Holstein cow. Where does your family live, Dr. Horst? I have no family. When I was a child, they were gassed to death in the Dachau concentration camp. Mm, tough. No, oh, it has its advantages. I have no ties on Earth. Nothing to lose now. I imagine I'm the only one on board who is free to enjoy our present peculiar position. All right, masters, you can button it up now. Aye, sir. Aye, sir. Well, gentlemen, check your sidearms. In one minute, we'll be the first men to set foot on Mars. Quite an honor, eh? As long as the medals are not rewarded posthumously. Still uneasy, Dr. Horst? Captain Black, I've been uneasy ever since I can remember. On Earth and on Mars. Well, 30 seconds. Give me the intercom phone, Lustig. Yes, sir. Masters? Aye, sir. Battle stations are to be manned till we return. If we're not back in two hours, I want no rescue party sent out. Blast off and save the ship, you understand? Aye, sir. All right. Five seconds. Four. Three. Two. One. Lustig, 
Open the outer airlock. I see. It's fresh air. Let's go. All right, now. Take it easy. It's too dark to move fast. Quiet, isn't it? Not even a wind. Can't see anything from this ground, Mr. Quiet. We don't know what's out here. All right, come on. What the... Quiet! Captain, I can swear that... That sounds like a rooster. I don't hear it anymore. Very homely but unlikely sound. A rooster crowing on Mars? Higston? Aye, sir. Set that machine gun 25 yards to the flank. We'll stay here till the ground mist lifts. Aye, sir. What do you make of the ground, Horst? Grass. Plain grass. You can see some large foliage there where the mist's thinned down. What the... Higston, hold your fire, you fool! I hit it, Captain! What? Some kind of wild animal. I hit it. I could see the traces, but it's still standing. Come on, Horst. Doctor, where are you? Up ahead! Admiring the wild animal. Careful, Horst. Wait for us. Don't worry, Captain. <laughs> it's an iron deer. A lawn ornament. Well, that, that's impossible. It's hollow. Interesting, isn't it? A whitewashed Victorian iron deer sitting on a lawn in the middle of Mars. I don't understand. Look around. The mist's lifting. Hey, Captain, look there. It's a house. A regular old-fashioned house. But, sir, on Mars. Good Lord. I haven't seen carved scrolls and gingerbread like that in years. Look at that port swing. The geraniums. There. I told you it was a rooster, Captain. Give me the glasses, Lustig. I want to take a look through that front window. Well, there's an upright piano. Some sheet music on it. Lustig, it's... It's beautiful Ohio. Yeah. It can't be, sir. Forrest... Horst, do you think that civilization of two planets could be identical? I don't know. That specific variety of geraniums is only 50 years old on Earth. Is it logical that they should develop in Mars? How about that porch swing and the piano and, and beautiful Ohio? Why, it's impossible. Captain Black, this looks like the town I was born in. Well, it, it looks like my hometown, too. I thought of something, sir. It's the only solution. Maybe, maybe we're not the first ship to reach Mars from Earth. Don't be ridiculous, Lustig. Oh, how else can you explain it? Suppose some scientists got together. They, they, they invented some spaceship and, and planted a colony here. That's the only answer. That's impossible, Lustig. Been space travel, it couldn't be secret. You have any idea what ships cost, what industrial power is needed? No, there's got to be some logical reason. I think perhaps we might find out, Captain. The light just went on in that house. Kingston, cover that door with the machine gun. I see. All right, come on, horse. We're going to ring that doorbell. There's got to be a scientific answer to all this. And there's something moving in there. Stand back, Horst. Give me a clear shot. Are you sure a bullet can stop a Martian? Steady now. Can I help you? I... Well, we... If you're selling anything, it's much too early. No, 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 wait just a minute. What... What town is this? What do you mean? Are you census takers? No, no. We're strangers here. We want to know how this town got here. Is this a game? No, no, it's not a game. We're from Earth. From where? From Earth. Do you mean out of the ground? Are you sure you're feeling well? Madam, we came in a flying ship across space. We're from the third planet, Earth. This is Mars. Now do you understand? Mars. You go away now, you hear? I'll call my husband from upstairs and he'll chase you. Go on. But this is Mars, isn't it? This is Green Lake, Wisconsin, in the United States of America. Bounded on the east by the Atlantic and on the west by the Pacific. Now go away. Goodbye. Horst, do you suppose it's really possible? I've got to find out more about this. I told you I'd call my husband. Now you go away. You've got to tell me one thing first. What year is this? Year? 1928, of course. For goodness sake. You hear that, Horst? And we know it's 1987. And we know this is Mars. Of course, is it possible that we got fouled up, made, made some tremendous blunder, circled around and landed back on Earth? In 1928? Well, maybe some switch in time or dimension. Could we have shifted somehow, gone, gone backward in time? Oh, Horst, this won't hold water. It's, it's not logical. We've, we, we checked every mile. We went past the moon, out into space. We're, we're on Mars. Find out anything, Captain? No, we're going back to the ship till I figure out some logical explanation for all this. Lustig out at point. Kingston in the rear. 
Keep that gun at half load. Aye, sir. First, there, there's got to be some cold, logical solution. Captain! What? That, uh, that, that house down the street, the white one with the green shutters. Lustig, what's the matter? I never thought I... I never thought of... Thank God! Lustig! Lustig, come back here! He's running for that house. That crazy fool after him, quick! Lustig, stop! Come down off of that porch! Grandpa! 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 Lustig, what the devil do you think you're doing? Albert! Oh, Grandma! Grandpa, it is you. Lustig, what is going on here? Albert, it's, it's been so many years. How you've grown, boy. It's so good to see you. Lieutenant Lustig! Oh. Captain, uh, Grandma, I want you to meet my friends. This is Captain Black. Captain, I want you to meet my grandfather. Howdy. Any friend of Albert's is a friend of ours. <laughs> How long have you been here, Grandma? Oh, a good many years, ever since we died. Ever since you what? Yes, sir. They've been dead 30 years. What? Oh, now, don't you trouble yourself. It's all right. We're alive again, that's all. You mean to tell me that Mars is heaven? Oh, nonsense, no. All we know is here we're alive again. And who are we to question God's infinite ways? Well, I... Lustig, we're going back to the ship... Captain, I, I want to talk to my grandpa. Lieutenant Lustig, I don't like any part of this. You'll come back with us if I have to club you and carry you. I see. Now let's go. Heaven only knows what they've run up against back at the ship. <laughs> First, look at that crowd around the ship. Looks like we're being welcomed with a celebration, Captain. Celebration! They've abandoned ship. Every port is open. No guard set. You! You, Master! Hiya, Captain. Meet my old dad. Dad, that's Captain Black. He's not a bad guy for an officer. Up on Hingston! Uh, uh, what, sir? Bring that band back. Use force if you have to. I, uh, oh, excuse me, sir. There's my Uncle George. Hingston! I'll be right back, Captain. Uncle George! Uncle George. What the devil is Don't going on here? Don't you understand, sir? They've all found friends and relatives. They're, they're all here! You're right, Captain. I've counted. The whole crew's out in the crowd. But I gave orders! Give it an order! You don't understand, Captain. I understand, Newtony. I don't care how many relatives show up. I'll have discipline. John! Johnny! What? Johnny, you old son of a gun! It's you! Edward! Yes! It can't be! Oh, of course it is! Johnny! Johnny, Ed. you old. <laughs> Ed! What? Dr. Horst! This is my brother, Edward. How do you do? Hello, sir. It's wonderful to. To see you, Edward. <laughs> Look, I've, I've got to get back to my ship. Oh, Johnny, wait. I almost forgot. Mom's waiting at home. Mom? Yeah, and Dad, too. Mom and Dad are alive? Then, then you're real, Ed. Well, of course. Don't I feel real? How's <laughs> <I'm> that, <sad>, huh? <laughs> Why, Ed! Ed! <laughs> we've, we've got lunch for you, Johnny. Mom's making corn fritters. Dr. Horst, haven't you found anybody? No, nobody. Well, then you come on home with me, right, Ed? Why, sure. Horst, Horst, you wouldn't believe it. But it's been 35 years since I had Mom's corn fritters. <laughs> By George, 35 years. kitchen, so don't hold back, Johnny. You too, Dr. Horace. Well, Johnny, you're still in the Navy, eh? Huh? That's right, Dad. I'm in command of the ship. We're an old Navy family, Dr. Horace. All three of our boys in the service. Yeah, Ed was the best pilot in the Pacific, too. What did happen, Ed? What's the difference? I'm here now. Yeah, but... You know, it's almost perfect. All we're missing is your brother, Will. Then the whole family could be together. Well, it won't be long, Mom. Will's in charge of the XR-54. Next rocket coming out to Mars. Oh. Well, little Will, when does he leave, Johnny? Well, the takeoff's scheduled for September, but uh -huh. it depends on what we report. Oh, oh, yeah. There's no question about that now, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> Christmas together again. That'll be something. Sure yes. will, yes, sirree. Well, uh, this calls for a celebration. How about a little of the old dandelion wine, eh, Johnny? Now, Father, don't you go giving Johnny too much wine. <laughs> <laughs> He's a big boy now, Mother. Well, sir, isn't everything just fine? Just fine.
good. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, play that one again, will you, Ed? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Dr. Horst, what are you doing sitting over here alone? What do you think of my little family? Very nice. You know, I can't understand why you didn't find any folks here, Dr. Horst. It's just a shame everybody else is so happy. Well, I never remembered my family, Mrs. Black. All I know is they were gassed at Dachau during the Second World War. When I was liberated, I was in delirium three months. I cannot remember anything before then. A psychiatric phenomena. Well, that's terrible. Isn't there anything anybody can do? I don't want to remember. I have not had a pleasant life. I prefer to be free of emotional entanglements. They interfere with a scientific approach. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Oh. Horst. Well, oh, I'll get it. It's our ring. Long and three shorts. I remember that. Well, maybe we'd better call it a night. You must be getting tired, Johnny. I'd better be going back to the ship. Nonsense. You stay the night. Uh, we'd sit. I just couldn't rest thinking of you all alone on that ship. Oh, I'll be all right. Well, good night. Oh, wait a minute, Dr. Horst. That phone message was for you. Me? Yes, that's right. Uh, a message from Anna. Anna? I don't... Well, there, she must be an old friend. Isn't that nice? Uh, I don't... You sure it was for me? I don't remember any Anna. Well, she asked if you were better. Perhaps she's someone who knew you at Dachau. Anna? She said she's coming over here first thing in the morning. So you'll have to stay over. Yes, well, but that da settles it, then. You stay here, Horst. You can bunk with me in my old room. Yeah, but, Johnny, we thought you'd like to be with Edward. So you could talk the way you used to. Well, we can't put Dr. Horst on the daybed. I think we'd better share the room tonight. Be plenty of time for talking, Ed. Uh, yes, I, I guess so. Well, I suppose I'd better drop back to the ship. You know, Ed, security check. Why do you have to do that here? Well, I, I don't know, Mom. There's no good reason, I guess. <laughs> well, suppose we skip it tonight, huh? Well, good night, everybody. Oh, it's good to have you home, Johnny. It's good to be home, Mom. <laughs> Black, hmm? You asleep? No, no, I've... I've been thinking about what we were expecting. <laughs> Green-skinned Martians with eyes on stocks, and all the time there was only Mom and Dad and... and Edward waiting. That's funny what tricks your imagination can play on you. Well, I guess Mars is heaven, Horst. You know, I've been thinking about Martians, too. Hmm? Captain, just suppose... Suppose there were Martians, and they saw us land, and suppose they thought of us as invaders. What would be the best weapon they could use against our atom bombs, huh? I don't see what you're getting at. They would want to disarm us first, huh? To wipe out all suspicion, to make us feel at home. Captain, suppose this house isn't real. Suppose the people are just images stolen from our own memories by Martians created for us by telepathy, hypnotism. Oh, that's, that's the craziest theory I ever heard. Maybe that's why there was no one for me, because in all my life there is no happy memory, no real loved person, not even my mother. I don't remember her, only the piles of rotting corpses of Dachau. There was no happy emotion for these people to recreate. How about that phone call, Anna? Yes, Anna. I didn't remember who she was, but I do now. I just remember. When I was freed from Dachau... Sick, delirious. I raved about a wonderful, kind nurse named Anna that took care well, of me. Well, there you are. It's logical. She's coming to see you tomorrow. But there was no Anna. I'd been nursed by a man. What? Anna was only a dream. And there's only one way they could have learned about her, by reading my subconscious mind. That's impossible, Horace. Why? A whole crew was thinking of home. Suppose the Martians read our minds. Yes, but if, if there are Martians... If there are, they have us separated each man in a different house, sleeping, trusting. No one at the guns. I left my pistol downstairs. 
Do you think there's something to this, Horst? It's a perfect trap, Captain. Who would suspect his own mother, his grandparents? How easy. Just a knife in the heart of each sleeping man. That's impossible, Horst. But we've, we've got to get back to the ship. Listen, the crickets have stopped. Come on. We don't know when they change back to whatever they really are. All right, careful. Where are you going, John? Ed, we, uh, we wanted a drink of water, that... That's all, Ed. You're not thirsty, John. You don't want a drink. Look out! You don't want a drink. His face! It's changing! He's a marsh! Run, horse! Run! You can't get away, John. This way, horse! Horse, where are you? Ah! Hello! Hello! Can you hear me, Earth? This... This is Captain John Black, the XR-53, calling for Mars. I've locked myself in the ship, but they've crippled it. I can't take off or fire the guns, and they're coming for me now, the Martians. I'm all alone here. All the rest are dead. Hingston, Lustig, Dr. Horst. Poor Horst, he didn't even reach the door. Listen, listen. They're trying to break through the hull. Edward and Mom and Dad and all the folks, but, but they're changing now. They're, they're melting and changing back into... They're Martians. Can you understand? Martians, not men. They, they made you think that Mars was heaven and we fell into the trap. Can you hear me, Earth? You've got to stop the next rocket. Listen, tell my brother Will. Tell my brother not to come. They'll trap him, too. They'll kill them all. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me, Earth? This is John Black on Mars. Hello, Earth? This is John Black on Mars. Hello, Earth? Hello, Earth? Tonight, X-1 has brought you the science fiction classic, Mars is Heaven. Written by Ray Bradbury and adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were Wendell Holmes as Captain Black and Peter Capel as Dr. Horst. With Bill Zuckert as Masters, Bill Lipton as Hingston, Margaret Berlin as the old lady, Bill Griffiths as Edward, Ken Williams as Lustig, Ethel Everett as Mom, and Edwin Jerome as Dad. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is a transcribed NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week, man is just beginning to discover how boundless our universe really is. And yet, as man reaches out to the stars, out toward infinity. Ironically enough, he may be building himself a new kind of prison. What would it be like to live all your life in a world no larger, say, than a single gigantic rocket ship bound on an endless journey? You'll find out next week when we present the Robert Heinlein story, Universe at X... X, 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 X minus... minus, 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 minus one... one. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked.
It's mystery time. Time now for the best in mystery. Tonight, mystery classic stars Sir Ralph Richardson in My Adventure in Norfolk. Sir Ralph Richardson. And Mystery Time presents him now, transcribed in the adventure classic, My Adventure in Norfolk, by A.J. Allen. Well, I don't know how it is with you, but four or five weeks after the new year, my wife always says to me, have you thought about where we shall go in August? And of course, I always said no. And then she starts looking through advertisements of bungalows to let. But it happened last year as usual, and I had forgotten all about it, as usual. Until one very foul morning in February, it was snowing like a barnstormer's production of East Lynn. Margaret looked up from her letters at breakfast and said, I think it's the very place. Uh-huh. The man seems very civil, too. Ah, good. You know, if you ask me, the government will never get this new bill through. It's in Norfolk, a place called Hicking Broad. Eh? What is it? Well, this bungalow, of course, I told you. It's furnished, too, with both house, garden, and garage. That uh, seems hardly possible. And patent linen. He says we can go and see it and stay the night. He'll arrange for a woman to come in and oblige. Now, oh, just a minute. I remember now. Isn't that the place with the exorbitant rent? Yes, but you'll have to talk to him about that. But he's bound to come down. They always do. My experience is they always don't. You're never firm enough. Anyway, we can go down on Thursday and stay the night. What? In this weather? It may be beautiful by then. You know what the weather is this time of year. Between then and Thursday, the weather did everything it does at any time of the year. But when the train battled its way into Potter Hyam Station, and we stood shivering on the platform, it was settled again, snowing hard. Fortunately, the car I'd ordered was waiting, and the five-mile drive to the bungalow, which seemed to be in the most desolate spot on earth, was accomplished with no more than average hazard. I was apprehensive in case the woman who was to oblige should have proved disobliging, but my fears were groundless. Although it was late and dark when we arrived, we found fires burning, and she'd even cooked us a steak apiece. Sophia, sure you'll be all right now, sir. I'll be getting along home. I can catch the last bus at the top of the lane. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Selson. Oh, we'll be quite happy now. Oh, said takes all right. I asked the butcher to pick it up special. Boy, well, very nice things. It's um, nice probably need sharpening. I'd stay if my husband was all right, but it brought the nasty operations, and if I denied it, I'd be a liar. If I was to tell you what they've done to him, then you'd all be been I'm angry. sure it must have been very trying. Well, if you might go, Mrs. Seltzer. Messy, that's what it was. And the dressings. Why, every night I have to... Are you sure that takes a nice man? You've hardly touched it. I mean, I don't think I feel very hungry after all. Uh, now, look here, we mustn't let you miss your bus, Mrs. Selton. Uh, I'll light you to the door. Oh, thank you, sir. Yeah, I rather like this oil lamp business to sell. It's not so stark as electricity. Ah, not saying much now, I see. Well, thank you very much for coming in. We'll be seeing you in the morning. Now, I can't think why they always refer to that type of woman as homely. Nursing homely would be a better description. What, tired, dear? I am, rather. Been a long day. Yes. I think bed's indicated. I tell you what, you go up. There's enough fire left in the bedroom for you to undress by. I'll boil a kettle and bring you up a hot water bottle. Mrs. Ting's left two enormous stone ones in the kitchen. I think I will go up, if you don't mind. Do you look dreadfully tired quite suddenly. 
I expected the reaction after rushing about all day. And, and the complete absence of any noise leaves you in a sort of vacuum. It's a quiet place, but I don't think I've heard a sound since we arrived. Well, that's funny. What is? That car, just as I said there. What, is it a car? I didn't hear anything. I um, mean, well, that's the bottom bench. I tell you what is funny. The way Miss Peter's going up to bed. Well, there isn't any up. This is a bungalow. <laughs> it goes southeast to bed, or is it northwest? Uh, oh. Anyway, off you go, dear. I won't be long with your bottle. When Margaret has gone, I put the kettle over the fire and lit my pipe. The kettle started singing away. And as it hadn't any competition, it sounded like a massed choir. On one of its downward cadences, I thought I heard the car again. I took the kettle off for a minute to listen. But there was nothing. Not that it mattered if there had been a car. Did you ever did when everything was very quiet, how you give every little noise its full value? Well, I put the kettle back and had a look out of the window. It was pretty dark, but with that sort of luminous dark look that you guess that it's snow. And then, it's on the road. Beyond the bungalow and behind some trees that bordered the road, I saw a light. I didn't want to bother Margaret, so I crept along the hall and moved from the front door quietly. What's that? Car. Don't they mean, dear? I just got to pop out for a minute. Whatever for? I thought you were coming to bed. Well, I am. Just a tick. Just fall to put the nose out first. Do mind what you're doing. You'll fall into a drift or something. But actually, I fell into an adventure. I suppose you could call it that. When I got out, the cause of the radiance was obvious. There was the light of a car, one of those square box-looking saloons with a flat radiator about the size of a small hotel. What was more interesting was there was a girl tinkling with the engine, quite an attractive girl as far as I could see, too. But she was pretty well muffled up with fur, so I couldn't be quite sure. Ah! Oh. Really? Anything I can do? Oh, thank you. I, I don't really know what's the matter. Just stopped. Oh, it smells hot, doesn't it? Are there any water in the radiator? There's no, I expect so. There are any water in radiators, isn't there? Ah, oh, it's for your fun. It depends whether anyone's remembered to put some in. Let's have a look, shall we? No. Oh. I can't see any. Eh? Why? Oh, she is hot. You know, we, we better get some water in there. I can get some from my garage. Couldn't we use snow? Oh, I'd better not. Now, uh, hold on, Jiffy. I'll get a bucket. <laughs> By the time I got back with a bucket of water, she found a funnel. And so I poured a little water into the radiator. Oh, look out now. Oh, oh, oh. Look about the volcano. I've even blown the fun around. Well, let me see if I can turn the engine over. And I couldn't move it. I'll have a go. Oh, oh come on up, you brute. No, oh, it's no good. It feels solid. I can't move an inch. Well, it's no good. I must get on. But my dear girl, there's miles to him. I can't help that. I tell you, I've got to... What's that? What what? That noise. It's... That's... Sounds like another vehicle coming. But if it comes this way, you can get him too, or at least a lift to a more acceptable room. I shall see it light. It's a long way off, though. You can keep up miles with that comfort. It struck me the girl didn't seem to be as pleased as she ought to have been. But as the lights and the sound of the engine got nearer, she was at first uneasy, then plainly scared. Hello there. What's up, Gab? Sleeping? Oh, back down, have you? Oh, yeah, this lady has. I'm pretty conflicted, too. She's seized up solid. I mean, the car has. Uh, I wonder if you could help with a toe or a lift. Well, I'm going to nod I could give the lady a lift that far if she liked. 
Uh, but uh, what about the car? Well, I tell you what, if you can give me a hand, we could put it into the garage for tonight. There's no car in it. And then, uh, Mr. Uh, if you could send for it in the morning, but it's not too late, though, because I'm going to London. That's further to we'll have to do. Well, a little gratitude on her part would have been more gracious. Well, a lorry driver, whose name turned out to be Williams, helped me push the car into the garage, and a tough job it was. It was heavy, for one thing, and the body and the wings were slippery as the snow and night. The girl made no attempt to help. She just fussed around as though she thought we might run off with the beastly thing. But she seemed a bit calmer when it was safely in with the doors locked. As we walked away from the garage, I suddenly realized how cold it was. Safe enough there, miss. No one could start it anyway. Oh, no. Oh, oh, it's cold. You know, you two ought to come in and have a drink before you start. Oh, but well, I, I don't mind mean, if I do that. Oh, I won't take a minute. It'll warm your boat this way. Uh, I'll come in a jiffy, sir. I don't. I bet it will be lolly out in the middle of the road in case anything else comes along. Don't want something up the back of it. I, I took for Gerlin and Tanta Mother sitting on fire, and then I went out again to show Williams the way in. I met him by the gate. Um. Lady of friend, you all say. Never seen her before in my life. If you ask me, though, there's something fishy about her. What's a young lady driving round at night and in this weather alone for? I mixed three whiskers and water. There was, wasn't any soda. I took my first opportunity to study the girl. But she's a bit older than I thought, and she she can go with a lack of friendliness. Well, oh, we've done nothing to deserve it. But a very hostility and suspicion, which is rather hard lines on us, considering. And she kept dodging out of the light. It struck me as odd. Uh, she hurried Williams over his drink in a rather foolish way, in view of the fact that he was to drive her. But when he had gone to start the engine, I asked her if she was all right for money, and apparently she was. Well, I reminded her to send the early for the car, and she said she would, and off they went. I... You asleep, dear? No. But I had been that dose for a minute. Why did you go out? Yes, sir. I, I thought I heard something. I went down to see. I was right to it. With a car broken down outside, and the girl all on my own. I gave her a drink, but she wouldn't stop. She's gone off to knowledge in a lobby. The girl? Would it stop her? Well, where's that car? We've shoved it in the garage. But you, you must have been gone for hours. Why didn't you wake me up? I told her about it and the way the girl had acted and how she'd been anxious to get away. Then Margaret said something which made me think. I think that whole thing's most peculiar. Peculiar? Well, funny you should say that. The knowledge chap said it was fishy. You can Where does she come from? This is an unimportant world. Not one you'd normally take. No, unless you were avoiding people. If you were driving a stolen car, for instance. A stolen car? Well, I never thought of that. <laughs> you wouldn't. It was a girl. If it was stolen. Funny, Joe, I'm going to have another look at that car. No, don't you move. I slip out and I look at it again. That car may hold a clue to the whole fishy business. It was very dark outside and was so still that the candle I carried burned without a flicker. It wasn't a large garage and the car nearly filled it. We backed it in so that it would be easier to tow out. Good. Up the sort of car I'd pinch. That engine is still warm. Well, I've seen the engine, there are no clues there. If I can squeeze along the wall, I can get a peeping at the back. Cut below, frosted windows. Oh no, of course not, it's rare fraud. I wonder if there's room to open the door. Of course, it would open away from me. Hey, don't shout. You're pinning me against the wall. I didn't know anyone was there. God, help. He wasn't pushing. He was a 
dead as a doornail. When I got over my first shock, I managed to bundle the, the body back into the car and have a look at it. It was the body of a tall man with a moustache and evidently been propped up on the floor against the door so that as soon as I opened the door, it had slumped out. It was tall and thin, dark, dressed in tweed and a raincoat, no papers in the pocket. There was a note case with nine pounds in it, no tailor's name on the clothes, and nothing whatever to give any clue of his identity. But it was obvious why he was dead. There was a bullet hole under his right shoulder blade. Someone had shot him from behind, and I guessed the bullet had gone through into the lung. Well, what was I to do? There was no phone in the house, and the nearest police station was probably miles away, and I had no transport. Besides, there was Margaret. I couldn't stroll off and leave her alone. There was no night to drag her round with me, round the countryside. In the end, I shut the car door again, carefully locked up the garage, and went to bed. What on earth have you been doing? What an age you've been. I'm sorry, sorry, darling, sorry. Well, did you find anything? Uh, yes, I uh, I found something in the back of the car. What was it? I found nine pounds. Nine pounds? In the back of the car? Yes, in the back of the car. In a wallet. Oh, how extraordinary. She must have forgotten all about you. Yeah. I wonder if she did. Well, how do you mean? Uh, I, I just wondered. What did you do with it? Well, I left it there. I thought it was this. After all, it was none of my business. Well, there's nothing we can do about it now, is there? No. No. Well, then. Let's go to sleep. Mm. Good night. It's just been pretty tired. The next thing I knew, it was broad daylight at 9 a.m. This is Stilson, it was due at 10, so I tumbled out pretty quickly. I wanted to have another look at the car and the body in daylight. Unfortunately, I think the mention of the nine quid had aroused my wife's curiosity, and she insisted on coming to the garage with me. Now, now, look here, dear, I, I didn't tell you last night, but, well, there's, um, there's something rather more to this than I said. You, um, you'll have to be prepared for a bit of a shock. A shock? Why? What else is there? Well, you see, the... But there's no car here at all. The garage is empty. I've never had such a shock in my life. No car, no body, nothing. There was a patch of grease on the floor where I dropped the candle, but otherwise there was nothing to show that I'd ever been in there. Another queer thing, there were no wheel marks. Either in the garage or outside, so it apparently snowed very heavily again and covered them up. It didn't look as though there'd been all that snow. Marzavid was inclined to laugh at the whole thing. We went back to the house, and she got some breakfast. <laughs> My belief is that you sat by the fire after I'd gone to bed, dozed and dreamt the whole thing. There never was any car or girl. Wishful thinking, probably. And did I dream going out to the garage again and finding the nine pounds? I don't know, but you must have missed a... Wait, wait a minute. Look here, the glasses. The glasses? Yes. I said I gave them a drink, didn't I? Well, if the glasses are there, that proves it. <laughs> I was in that drawing room like a start. The glasses were there, three of them, just as they'd left them. So I had been right. But I still didn't say anything about the body. The mystery was quite mysterious enough already. Besides, an idea was forming at the back of my mind, and I wasn't ready to talk about it. But if there was a car and a girl came back and took it, how did she do it without waking them? Well, the garage is so close to the hunt, and we're not headed sleeping. She couldn't have done this alone anyway. It wouldn't have started. So it had to be either towed or pushed, neither of which could be done by one person. What are you going to do with that glass? Why have you wrapped it in your handkerchief? I'm going to take it away with me. 
I didn't say a word to Mrs. Selston about our night fun and game, but I settled up with her, and soon after that our previously ordered car came to drive it to the station. On the way, I called on the landlord of the bungalow and told him we'd let him know about taking it. Neither Margaret nor I could make up our minds just then whether we wanted to see the place again or not. I had the girl's glass with me, carefully packed in that biscuit tin. And when we reached Liverpool Street, that's it. Yes, yeah, all right, Jack. All right. Scuff to the yard. <laughs> I was lucky. My friend Inspector Gregson was in. He was even quite pleased to see me. But I didn't tell him the story to begin with. It seemed a bit thin in broad daylight. But I brought out the glass and I asked him if he could test it for prints and identified them. Well, he was a bit amused, but Gregson was the sport and he knows me. Well, his chaps were awfully quick on the job. It wasn't long before one came back and laid a file on the desk in front of the inspector. Gregson thumbed it through for the bed. And then he looked up and grinned at me. Well, Alan, we know your little lady right enough. I've got a picture of her here, too. And is that the damsel you're looking for? Yes, that's her fight, too, yes. Who is she? Oh, she had lots of names at different times, but her last one was Naomi Sterling. She was in twice for shoplifting, but that was early in her career. Later on, she took up with the leader of a very well-known race gang, one of the naughtiest pieces of work we've had in this country. There, there's a picture of him, too. Yeah, I heard it. Good Lord, the body. What? Uh, uh, it doesn't matter for a minute, no. Go on. What? Do you know any more about these people? Uh, quite a bit. This race gang fell foul of another gang, and there was a bit of a scrap. Then his boyfriend, he was known as Smug, got shot dead in the fight. And then he managed to get him away in a car, but the car broke down. Uh, this was somewhere in Norfolk, I believe. But Gregson, look here. Oh, well, go on. Well, it seems that she left the car and the dead man in the garage belonging to some simple oaf that she'd kidded into helping her. Anything the matter, Evan? No, no, nothing. Oh, go on, go on. Well, she left it in this garage and got a lift in the milk lorry that was going to Norwich. Only she never got there. Come on. I see. Well, you knew all about this, and you picked her up on the way. <laughs> no, we didn't. We didn't know about it until afterwards. Apparently, the lorry was being driven pretty furiously in the snow, and it skidded on a bend and hit a wall. Naomi and the driver, a chap named William, was thrown out and rammed their heads against the wall. And that, in case you don't know, is a very, very fatal thing to do. Anyhow, it was in their kit. You're know, looking like a fish for it, you believe me? Yes. Uh, no, I mean... Look here, Gregson, I know you chaps are pretty smart, but how on earth can you know all this and have it there in black and white. There hasn't been time. It only happened last night. Last night? <laughs> last night's my foot. It happened four years ago this February. And the people we are talking about have been dead for four years. Then, great Scott, Ellen, what's the matter? You look as though you'd seen a ghost. <laughs> and that was the end of my adventure in Norfolk. But just think of it. I could have stuck to that nine card. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. 
You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. Appointment with Fear. This is your storyteller, the man in black. Here again to bring you another placid evening in our Far Side series, Appointment with Fear. This is the story of a man who commits murder and gets away with it. Does the idea shock you? Do you believe that justice must always be done? But you and I needn't be cynics to know that justice is very seldom done in this world. Innocence flinches. Guilt is childish and bland. Innocence is imposed upon. Guilt can compass all things. Even a successful murder. And I know this because... <laughs> because... Because I was the murderer, you ask? They would hardly tell you that if you inquired at Scotland Yard. I was the victim. <laughs> In Bond Street, not far from Piccadilly, there used to be an establishment which in a less fashionable part of town would have been called a shop. On the windows, in letters as discreet as a visiting card, were the words, Charles Markham, antique dealer. Forty years ago, far back it takes us, this antique shop, despite deep carpets and crystal chandeliers, was a dingy place. It rustled with the ticking of a hundred clocks. It was shadowed by damascened armor and the colors of tall tapestries. And late one summer night, when the shutters had long been closed on the windows, a four-wheeler drew up at that door in the gaslit street Cabby, you needn't wait. Very good, miss. Good night. Good night. He must be here. He must be. I won't go back to that place. I'll kill myself first. Now, look here, old man. You needn't. I beg your pardon. And I beg yours. I'm not the person you're expecting, am I? No, madam. As a matter of fact, I was expecting a police officer. A police officer? Um, merely an old friend who often drops in for a talk and a drink. You are Mr. Markham, aren't you? Yes, my name is Markham. Can I be of any service to you? I want to come in. I want to buy a present for somebody. <laughs> really, madam, this is hardly the time. <laughs> yes, I, I know it's late. It's nearly one o'clock, madam. Surely tomorrow morning. Oh, that'll be too late. This is a special occasion. It's... Uh, it's a birthday present. Yes, it's a birthday present, and I've, I've got to deliver it at breakfast. And Sir George Little says this is the only place in London to buy antiques. Sir George flatters me. <laughs> Won't you let me come in just for five minutes? Well, under the circumstances, madam, I think it might be managed. Now, one moment, while I put some lights on. Uh, no, please. That one little light will be enough. But you won't be able to see anything. <laughs> that doesn't matter. I'll, I'll trust your judgment. Just as you like. This way, madam. What's that? That noise? Noise? Oh, you mean the clocks, madam. There are more than a hundred clocks in this room. I'm very fond of them. 
Don't they get on your nerves, ticking away together like a nightmare, striking the hours together? They don't strike together. When the hour approaches, you'll hear a musical din that lasts for some time. Might I interest you in perhaps a clock? No. I hate them. Well, all the same, this grandfather clock might amuse you. What about it? Observe the signature. Johannes Carver. Londinae Fisit Anno Domini 1752. You could see better, madam, if you raise that veil. I'll keep my veil down. Just as you please. But look at the clock. I open the glass. I open the glass face. Like this. I push the second hand forward. Like this. And... What was that voice? Only the clock, madam. Nothing more. The, the clock spoke. <laughs> Clever, isn't it? A device of old John Carver, anticipating Mr. Edison's gramophone by more than a hundred years. But you don't like clocks. No. May I ask whether the present is for a lady or for a gentleman? It's uh, uh, for a man. Has he some knowledge of antiques? Uh, no. Uh, yes, I mean he... Uh... Oh. Furniture, perhaps. Porcelain? Bronzes, tapestries, weapons. He might be very much interested in weapons, yes. Then I imagine his name is Mr. Ronald Gilbert. Will you tell me, Miss Ray, why you really came here tonight? So you know who I am. Naturally. You're Miss Judith Ray. Why did you come here? I wanted to see what sort of man you actually were. Mm, have you found out? No. But I won't go back to prison. I won't. Since this is to be a business conference, Miss Ray, and I imagine it is. Yes? And then suppose we go into my office here at the back of the shop. Will you precede me? Thank you. You must excuse the dust covers I put on the chairs here. I, I'm leaving for holiday tomorrow and the shop will be closed. When I return next week, Miss Ray, I shall expect the amount requested... In cash, of course. But I can't raise 2,000 pounds. You ought to know that. Your fiancé could raise the money, I imagine. Ron? Do you think I'd have Ron know where I've been and what I've been? It's better than having his father know, surely. Sit down, Miss Ray. I'd rather stand, thank you. No, no, that's a very foolish gesture. But the ladies will do it. They think it gives them dignity and shows their disdain of the poor blackmailer. I, oh, you see, I make no bones. I am a blackmailer. You seem rather proud of yourself. Why not? It's the one... I'm the one person in England, perhaps in the world, who's made it a large-scale business. Congratulations. After all, what is life but blackmail? The child says... If you don't give me that, I'll scream. The grown woman says, if you go on behaving like this, I'll leave you. Your sex, Miss Ray, are blackmailers from the cradle. You know Charles Markham. Well? I wonder if anybody has ever hurt you, Ben. Hurt me? What do you mean? When you talk about the world and people in general, your face goes white under the eyes. You pick up that letter opener from the desk. Oh, not a letter opener, Miss Ray. A Medici dagger, 16th century work. It isn't the money that really interests you, is it? You hate the world. You want to torture people as you think you've been tortured. Isn't that so? This is a very sharp dagger, Miss Ray. If I throw it down on the desk, it sticks like that. Isn't it so, Charles Markham? My motives, Miss Ray aren't in question. I wonder. Whereas your motives are. Now, let me see. Ten years ago, in 1894, a certain girl called Letty Wilson, your real name, I believe, fell in love with a rather contemptible underworld character named Arthur Aker. Please. No humiliation was too great for her. She worked for him, lied for him, stole I was only 18. I didn't know what I was doing. This girl, for a very shabby theft, was sentenced to three years penal servitude at Holloway Prison. Five months later, she escapes from prison and disappears. 
All these years afterwards, she appears in the West End as Judith Ray, fashionable millionaire. Haven't I made up for it? Haven't I? No. For one mistake after ten years? That's the way of the world, my dear. I didn't create it. But, ooh, I'm forgetting the best part of the comedy. This paragon of virtue next falls in love with Mr. Ronald Gilbert, son of Major General Sir Edmund Gilbert. Such a respectable family, too. Oh, please. Then... Shall we say two thousand pounds? Suppose I did raise the money. I, I don't know how, but suppose I did raise it. Well? Well, what guarantee would I have? You wouldn't ask for still more money. Well, I probably shall ask for more money, Miss Ray. That's my privilege as a black killer. <sighs> then I'm never going to be free of you. Is that it? Frankly, that's it. Unless I... Kill you, of course. What if... What if I did kill you? People have threatened that before, but... They haven't meant it. Maybe I mean it. Well, we can easily test you out. There's a sharp knife stuck in the desk in front of you. I'm going to get up... and deliberately turn my back on you like this. Be careful, Charles Markham. As a student of human nature, I'm curious... How much will you risk to keep this secret? Have you the courage to kill and risk hanging? Yes, I think I have. Look out, you fool. What was that? <laughs> Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad you held back at the last moment, Miss Ray? I said, what was that? That, my dear, was the front door bell. Probably my friend, Inspector Ross from Wigmore Street Police Station. Come on in, old man. The front door isn't locked. You wanted me to attack you, didn't you? No. I was merely curious. And in any case, Miss Ray, it would be useless to kill me. Useless? Why? Because I shouldn't die. Oh, don't talk rot. It's quite true. A man in my position must take certain precautions. If you killed me, I should be... I should be back to haunt you within half an hour. And I don't happen to be joking. Come in. Now, look here, Markham. I... Oh! Miss... Oh, no. Mr. Ronald Gilbert, as I live. Ron, what are you doing here? He hasn't got anything against you, has he? Speak up, Mr. Gilbert. Have I? Well, the, the fact is, Judith, I... Uh, I... <laughs> look at him, Miss Ray. See how he changes color and clenches his hands and altogether assembles a boy caught at the jam cupboard. The perfect picture of a gentleman being a gentleman. Now, look here, Markham. I'm not very clever. You can always make a fool of me when you start talking. Let's stop talking. I've brought the money. What money? Mary, my fee for keeping quiet about you. So you went to Ron, too. You told him about it. But naturally. If possible, always sell your wares in two markets. How much money? Never mind, Judith. I hoped I could keep you out of this without your knowing. How much money? Three thousand. It's all I could raise. Has he told you who I am and what I've been? Listen, Judith, I don't care who you are or what you've been. I, I happen to be in love with you. I uh, Never mind. Let's get out of here. Oh. Ron, it's no good deal and to come back for more money. I know that, but what else can we do? Nothing, I'm afraid. What's that knife doing stuck in the desk? Nothing dangerous, I assure you. No? Merely a curio. I pick it up like this. I flip it down like this. And pick it up again. Miss Ray was much interested in the dagger... May I have that envelope with the money, please? There you are. Take it. Thank you. As I explained to Miss Ray, I am leaving tomorrow for a holiday. Hence the general disarray and the dust covers on the chairs. Before my departure, I'm glad we could settle this affair as you, as you would say, like gentlemen. Before we clear out of here, Markham, there's just one favor I'd like to ask. Of course, old man, ask away. This is your job, I suppose. You can't help being what you are, but never again, as long as you live. Well? Never even say that word, gentlemen. Be careful, Ron. Look at his face. Tell me, Mr. Gilbert, how much money is in this envelope? You heard what I said, 3,000 pounds. Then take it back, my friend. I find we can't strike a bargain after all. What do you mean? Just what I say. Here's your money. 
You will now oblige me, both you and Miss Ray, by leaving my shop. What's up? What are you going to do? Tomorrow morning, perhaps even tonight, I'm going to get in touch with the police. I shall tell them where they can find Letty Wilson, alias Judith Ray. You can't do that, Markham. Oh, yes, he can. You hit it where it hurts. Three thousand pounds, my friend, is not enough compensation for the way you talk. There's the way. Through the shop. Shall I escort you to the front door? No. You prefer to stay here and make a fool of yourself? You're not going to tell the police, Markham. I promise you that. And how are you going to stop me? With this... Run! Put that gun away! It's a funny thing, Judith. I, I felt a bit of a fool bringing this revolver along. But now I've got a use for it. Oh, yes, I've got a use for it. Maybe the best thing would be to go into the street now and call a policeman. You'll never get to the street, Markham. Are you following me into the shop? Yes. So, both of you, it appears, came here under false pretenses. You said you wanted to pay me some money. The money's still there, but you've lost your chance to get it. And our dear Judy said she wanted to buy a present for you. I showed her this grandfather clock here. This speaking clock. Don't go a step beyond that clock, Markham. I warn you. Nonsense, old man. You wouldn't dare shoot. Wouldn't I? No. And I call your bluff. One step. Two steps. Ah! Oh! Uh, I know. I know your whole silly tribe, my friend. You wouldn't risk it. You wouldn't. What's happening to me? Don't try to grab at the clock, Markham. It won't save you. You wouldn't risk. You wouldn't risk your life. You wouldn't risk your family position. You wouldn't. Oh. 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 I had to do it, Judith. Don't you see? I had to do it. Did you? Is he? Yes, he, he's done for. I tell you, I had to do it. Maybe he's not dead, Ron. Go and look at him. He's dead, all right. Please, Ron. Go and look at him. Well? Shot through the heart. The bullet went clean through him and smashed the face of the grandfather clock. That's all I can see in this dim light. This isn't happening to us. It can't be happening. Wait a minute. He said he was going for a holiday. That gives us time. It means his absence won't be noticed. The, the shop will be closed. Nobody will come here for days and certainly nobody will come here tonight. And What's that? What police officer? A friend of Markham's. Inspector somebody or other from Wigmore Street. He's expected here tonight. Oh, then we're finished. No, Ron, we're not finished. You can't see anything out there. The shutters are open. The door's covered. Could you... Could you pick up Markham and carry him? Yes, I, I, I can manage that. Why? There must be a back way out of the shop. Probably in the office. Hurry, Ron, hurry. He's, he's as heavy as a sack of meal. He seems to be looking straight at me. No. Did you see the expression in his eyes just before you... No. He seemed to be looking behind us or, or beyond us. He said, through the door, quick. This police officer, Judith, he can't get into the shop, can he? Of course he can. The front door isn't locked. Our only hope is the back way. I thought I'd seen the back door. Oh, there it is. Just a minute. Sorry, Ron, it's locked. Isn't there a key? No. Maybe in his pockets, on but a key ring. time, Ron. I think I have the front door open. Oh, this is just coming in. I've got it. Dust covers. What? Those white cloth covers that fit over the chairs. Look at them. What on earth are you talking about? We used about? to play a game when we were kids. Somebody sits in a big chair, you fit the dust cover over him, and nobody can tell he's sitting there. Don't you see, Judith? That's how we can hide Markham's body. It, it might work if, if there's time. There's got to be time. Take the cover off that big wing chair. All right, maybe there's a chance. I'll fit him into it. Arms along the chair arms. Feet push back. Now put the cover back again and pull it down round his feet. Don't let it touch his chest. The blood will show through. There. That's got it. You can't see anything now, can you? No. But 
Wrong. Well? What did you do with the gun? The what? The revolver, the gun you shot Markham with. Oh, the fact is, Judith, I, I put it down on the floor when I picked up his body. Out in that other room? Yes, I, I'm afraid so. Oh, it's too late now, old girl. The police are here. Oh, what, are we, what are we going to say? I don't know. Trust your wits and try to brazen it out. Yes? Come in. Good evening, Mr. Miss Ray. <gasps> Good evening, Mr. Gilbert. Charles Markham. You're Charles Markham. Correct, Miss Ray, but why should that surprise you? Why do you look as though you were seeing a ghost? Because we are seeing a ghost. If you're Charles Markham, whose body... Oh, Judith, be careful. Body? Miss Ray, did you say body? Oh, Miss Ray is upset. She doesn't know what she's talking about. If you killed me... I should be back to haunt you within half an hour. That's what you said. I tell you, Miss Ray isn't herself. She, she, she had bad news today. A, a relative of hers died. I, I, I've been trying to make her feel better. Oh, indeed. Did you think it would make her feel better to bring her here? I, I don't understand. My dear sir, you're very welcome, but the situation is surely a little... odd. I come in here and find you two looking as guilty as a pair of murderers in my private office in the middle of the night. Did you see anybody else here? There's nobody here, Mr. Markham. Not a living soul. Then you didn't, by any chance, meet my brother? Your... your brother? Yes. My brother, Robert. You couldn't have mistaken him if, if you'd seen him. He looks so much like me that few people can tell us apart. Then that's... Poor Robert often deputizes for me. He's learned to act like me, think like me, talk like me, but he, he doesn't like the work much. He thinks, poor fellow, my profession is beneath contempt. But he acts the part and acts it well, because I pay him. And I find it useful to have a double who will run risks for me. What have you done with his body? We haven't done anything with him. I see... Oh, well, <laughs> in that case, all we can do is to sit down and make ourselves comfortable. Will you sit there, Mr. Gilbert? And uh, you, Miss Ray, in that wing chair by the window. What's wrong, Miss Ray? Why don't you sit down? Because I prefer to stand, thank you. Oh, then perhaps you won't mind if I sit in this wing chair. It's a very comfortable one, my brother always says. Don't sit down there, for the love of God, don't sit down there. So, that's it. Yes, that's it. It is rather a thick chair. I press against the dust cover, and blood comes through. I lift the bottom of the dust cover, and... What's the use of going on with this? I killed him. You admit it? Yes, I admit it. But Judith had nothing to do with this. I swear she hadn't. My telephone, you notice, is against the wall. I shall have to turn my back to you when I ring. Ring? Where? Wigmore Street Police Station. Give him a chance. Please, give him a chance. Hello? Operator. I want Region 0586. I won't let them take you wrong. I won't. It's no good, Judith. I killed a man. I meant to kill him, and that's all there is to it. A very sensible attitude, my friend. And if the lady has any idea of flying at me with that knife, just notice what I've got here. A .32 revolver. One chamber fired. Picked up off the floor in that other room. Where? Hello? Wigmore Street Police Station. For the last time, Mr. Markham, won't you give him a chance? Be quiet, Mr. Wigmore. May I speak to Inspector Ross, please? Inspector Ross speaking. Isn't that Mr. Markham? Got it, did you want, Inspector? Charles Markham here. I understood you were going to drop in and see me tonight. I intended to, Mr. Markham, but I'm afraid I can't make it now. Oh, why not? Anything wrong? Only a robbery in David Street, but it's likely to be a long job. Sorry I can't get there. Oh, that's perfectly all right, Inspector. Actually, I rang up to say to make sure you wouldn't come here tonight. I've got a lot of work to do, and I'm leaving for Eastbourne early tomorrow morning. Oh, let's make it some other time, shall we? Can't you, Mr. Markham. No crimes being committed up your way, I suppose? No, Inspector. It's as quiet as the grave. Goodbye. What are you saying? Why did you do that? Please don't excite yourself, Miss Ray. 
Didn't you hear what I told the inspector? You're not doing this without a reason. Naturally not. Has it occurred to you, either of you, that I might not want my business dealings revealed in court? Stop a bit. What? Has it also occurred to you that a man's double who looks exactly like him and shares all his secrets may become a danger rather than an asset? He knows too much, he wants too much, and so... I think I understand. You're glad he's dead. Oh, no. Not glad, my dear. You shock my brotherly feelings, Doctor. Definitely relieved. Oh, then what? You may quiet your fears, Mr. Gilbert. You may stop trembling for good, Miss Ray. I shall save your skins because I mean to save my own. And now, while we are all in... In the mood, shall I show you how we can dispose of my brother's body? This, as I said before, is the story of a man who commits murder and gets away with it. Ronald Gilbert, now an old and honored man, looks back across the years and is still firmly convinced of his own guilt. But of course, Ronald Gilbert never shot anybody. I was the man who committed the murder. Don't you remember? The bullet that killed my brother is supposed to have passed through his body and smashed the face of the grandfather clock. But that's an impossibility. The face of a grandfather clock is much higher than the heart of a man. You see, two shots were fired at the very same instant. Ronald Gilbert missed and smashed the clock face. I fired from the door of the office at the rear and did not miss. That was why my brother looked past those two. I went out by the back door, locked it, and reappeared at the front afterwards. It was not Robert Markham who died. I am Robert Markham. It was Charles who died that night. And I killed him to stop his blackmailing business forever. His records I destroyed. His correspondence I burnt. I have assumed his name and identity ever since. Dare you say, if I stood on trial for murder, that you would condemn me? Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, Jot down ideas for that novel you want to write. Use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness Journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Basil Rathbone inviting you to join me beyond the green door. Today's story is about Frank Davis, a man who learned to his sorrow how to penetrate beyond the green door. Frank Davis was a man with an obsession. 
Others, like him, collected mountains of newspapers or miles of string, or they spent a lifetime trying to devise a foolproof betting system or a surefire way of beating the stock market. Frank Davis' particular obsession was magic. He lived alone in a rented room, and his only companion was a cat. His chairs were piled high with books, his walls were covered with sorcerer's tools, and his closets were stuffed with herbs and essences. People left him alone, and Frank liked it that way. He knew that someday he would find the proper spell and a demon would appear and grant him one glorious wish. At night he dreamed. That day he worked on his formulas. His black cat lay nearby, her yellow eyes half-closed, looking the very soul of magic. And Frank labored on, testing the infinite combinations of his formulas. He had grown so used to failure that success caught him by surprise. One day a wisp of smoke appeared in the middle of his room. The demon slowly took form, and Frank, who had dreamed of this moment for so long, found himself shaking with fear. Somehow in all those years, he had never decided exactly what he would ask when a demon did appear. The wisp of smoke grew into a huge grey shape. Frank paced up and down, wrung his hands, stroked his cat, gritted his teeth, bit his nails, and desperately tried to think. One wish, and only one wish, that was the rule. But what would he wish for? Wealth? Or was power more valuable? Should immortality be considered? Or would a more modest wish be safer? The demon was fully formed now. Its pointed head brushed the ceiling and its lips were twisted into a devilish leer. Your wish, the demon bellowed in a voice so loud that both Frank and his cat backed away. His wish. Hmm. What was it to be? The moments were ticking away, and the demon was growing impatient. If he didn't hurry, the demon might leave, never to return. But after twenty years of striving for this moment, Frank wanted to make the best wish possible. He thought again of the various advantages offered by power or wealth or immortality. Then, just as he was about to decide, he saw that the demon was grinning at him. It's irregular, the demon said, but I think it fulfills the conditions. Frank didn't know what the demon was talking about. Then a wave of dizziness overcame him, and the room went black. When his vision had returned, Frank saw that the demon was gone. His one great chance was wasted, and everything was just as it had been. Well, uh, not quite as it had been. For Frank noticed that his ears had grown long, and his nose had grown even longer. He had grey fur instead of skin. And he had a tail. That treacherous demon had changed him into a beast. There was a noise behind him, and then Frank realized what had happened. He ran with the speed of desperation, while the room loomed hugely around him. A single blow smashed him down, and he saw a fierce, whiskered face above him with gigantic teeth ready to bite. And Frank knew that his hesitation had caused his doom. It was horribly apparent now that his cat had made a wish, which the demon had accepted. And naturally enough, his cat had wished for a mouse. He is young and intelligent, and highly trained. He is Eric Banfeld, shipwrecked on a long-forgotten colony world where brawn and brute strength are more valued than knowledge, physically untrained and emotionally unprepared in the barest skills of survival. He seems compelled to spend a short and very unpleasant life as a half-naked savage worked like a beast of burden on a world so sunk into barbarism that its inhabitants have no concept of the wheel. It's either that or die. His only possible chance, his only hope of becoming one with the folk, is to become a singer or teller of stories. But in Eric Banfeld's case, he must be a singer of lies. Singer of Lies, a science fantasy novel by Michael R. Collings. Here are a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com.
Such ordinary things make me afraid. Sunshine, sharp shadows on grass, white roses, children with red hair, and the name Harry. Harry, such an ordinary name. Biotex, the new soak and pre-wash powder presents Beyond Midnight by Michael McCabe. Yet the first time Christine mentioned it, I felt a premonition of fear. She was five years old, due to start school in three months' time. It was a hot, beautiful day, and she was playing alone in the garden as she often did. I saw her lying on her stomach in the grass, picking daisies and making daisy chains with laborious pleasure. The sun burned on her pale red hair and made her skin look very white and lovely. Her big blue eyes were wide with concentration. Suddenly, she looked towards the bush of white roses, which cast its shadow over the grass, and smiled. Yes, I'm Christine. She rose and walked slowly towards the bush, her plump little legs defenseless and endearing beneath the too short cotton skirt. She was growing fast. Now, darling. Goodbye, Miss Gilmore. Goodbye. Chris? Who are you talking to? Harry. And who's Harry? Harry. I couldn't get anything else out of her, so I just gave her some cake and milk and read to her until bedtime. As she listened, she stared out at the garden. Once she smiled and waved. It was a relief, finally, to tuck her up in bed. And feel she was safe. What do you mean, Jim? Well, it's not so rare for only children to have an imaginary companion. I had one myself called Oz. Used to talk to him all the time. Well, some kids talk to their dolls. Chris has never been very keen on dolls. She hasn't any brothers or sisters, so uh, she talks to. Uh, what was it? Who did you say? Harry. Harry. Well, she hasn't any friends of her own age, so she imagines someone. Harry. But. But, Jim, why has she picked that particular name? Oh, you know how kids pick things up. I don't know what you're worrying about. Honestly, I don't. Well, I'm not worrying exactly. It's just that I... Well, I feel extra responsible for her. More so than if I were her real mother. Sure. Sure, but Chris is all right. Chris is fine. She's a pretty, healthy, intelligent little girl. <laughs> a credit to you. And to you. In fact, a thoroughly nice parent. Oh, yes. And so modest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's silly of me, I know, but... Oh, I just get a bit worried sometimes. I feel better now. You always make me feel better. About everything. I felt consoled until the next morning. Again, the sun shone brilliantly on the small, bright lawn and white roses. Christine was sitting on the grass, cross-legged, staring towards the rose bush, smiling. Hello. I hoped you'd come. Because I like you. How old are you? I'm only five and a bit. I'm not a baby. I'm going to school soon, and I'm going to have a new dress. Oh, yes, I did go for a little while. Infant school. 
But I didn't stay very long because we moved. Daddy had to go somewhere else for his work. And, yes, this time I'm going to start big school properly. And I'll stay there for years and years and years. And I'm going to have a green dress. Do you go to school? Well, what do you do then? I felt myself going cold as I stood listening to her. Don't be silly, I told myself. Lots of children have an imaginary companion. Just carry on as if nothing were happening. Don't be a fool. But I called Chris in earlier than usual for mid-morning milk. Can Harry come to? No. Goodbye, Harry. I'm sorry you can't come in, but I've got to have my milk. Why can't Harry have some milk? Who is Harry, darling? Harry. He's my brother. But, Chris, you haven't got a brother. Daddy and Mummy have only got one child, one little girl, and that's you. Harry can't be your brother, darling. Yes, Harry's my brother. He says so. She drank her milk and emerged with a smeary top lip. And then she grabbed at a plate of biscuits. Well, at least Harry hadn't spoiled her appetite. He's your brother. He says so, does he? Oh, yes. He's nice. I must have my new dress soon because I want to show him, Mummy. It says green's a nice colour. Well, I wish Harry could come to my new school with me. He'd be able to look after me. He said he would look after me. Does he come? I'll say one thing for imaginary companions. They help the child with their talking. With an accent. Accent? A cockney accent. Today, Chris... Well, she started speaking to me with a... With a, a sort of cockney accent. Just a slight one. <laughs> My dearest, every London child gets a slight cockney accent. It'll be even worse when she gets to school. I mean, the big school meets all the other kids. Don't worry. We about... don't talk Cockney, Jim. Where does she get it from? June. Who I... can she be getting it from except her? The butcher, the baker, the milkman, the coalman, the, the window cleaner. Want any more? I suppose not. Hmm. Oh, that's so silly, but I... I can't help it. It's just that... Well, oh, darling, everything was so nice, so happy, till, till this Harry business. Do you know what I think? I think you should put your mind at rest. What? Take Chris along to see old Dr. Webster tomorrow. Let him have a little talk with her. Jimmy, do you think she's ill in her mind? Oh, good heavens, no. It's just that you're obviously upset about it. You, well, you don't understand, and... When we meet something we don't understand, it's as well to take professional advice, that's all. That's what doctors are for. That's what they take a couple of quid from my salary every week for. Go and see Webster. Yes, I will. Here, have a cigarette. <sighs> Thank you. It's a fairly unusual case, Mrs. James, but by no means unique. I've had several cases of children's imaginary friends becoming so real to them that their parents get the jitters. Now, Christine's rather a lonely little girl, isn't she? Oh, she won't be when she goes to school again, but... Well, I suppose she is at the moment, yes. <laughs> she doesn't know any other children. We're, we're quite new to the neighborhood. Yes, you, you moved, haven't you? Well, I think you'll find these fantasies will disappear when she gets to school and meets the other children. At the moment, this friend of hers is a compensation for real children. You see, every child needs company of her own age. If she doesn't get it, well, she invents it. Older people who are lonely, they talk to themselves, but that doesn't mean that they're crazy or anything. It's just that, uh, well, they need somebody to talk to. Yes. The child is more practical. Seems silly to talk to oneself, says the child, so uh, it invents another, a real person. Now, I don't think you've got anything to worry about. Oh, that's what my husband says. Well, I'm sure he does. Still, I'll have a chat with her as you bought her. Oh, yes. Uh, leave us alone together, hmm? Yes. 
Christine, just come here a minute, will you, darling? I'll be waiting. Where, well, Chris? Yeah. See, Mommy, down there by the rose bush. It's just like our rose bush, isn't it? Do you see him? There's no one there. Now, Dr. Webster wants to see you. Now, you remember him, don't you? He gave you sweets when you were getting better with chicken pox. Hello, Christine. My, you're growing. Shooting up. She went into Webster's surgery willingly enough. I waited restlessly. <laughs> she was talking away to the doctor in a way she never talked to me. You see, I knew then that he would be full of reassurances when they came out. But I was afraid. Awfully afraid. And the ridiculous thing was, I couldn't put my fear into words. Harry is waiting. By the rose bush. See him? Nothing wrong with her, whatever. She's just an imaginative little monkey, that's all. A word of advice, Mrs. James. Let her talk about Harry. Let her become accustomed to confiding in you. I gather you've shown some uh, disapproval of this brother of hers. So he doesn't talk much to you about him. Christine? Hmm? He makes wooden toys, doesn't he, Chris? Yes, Harry makes wooden toys. And he can read and write, can't he? Yes, and swim, and paint, and climb trees. He can do everything. You see? Sounds quite a wonderful brother to me. He's even got red hair like you, hasn't he? Harry's got red hair. Redder than mine, too. And he's nearly as tall as Daddy, only slimmer. He's as tall as you, Mummy. He's 14. <laughs> Don't you worry, Mrs. James. You let her prattle. Thank you, Doctor. Goodbye, Chris. Give on up to Harry. to school. Chris, you know you oh, are. Oh, school oh, Harry. He'll, he'll feel silly. A great lad of 14 amongst all those little children. I won't go to school without Harry. I won't. I won't. I won't. I won't. Chris, I'm sorry, darling. I, I didn't mean... You see, darling, it's just that... Well, you wouldn't like Harry to be unhappy, would you? Would you? It was still daylight. Golden shadows and long strips of sunlight in the garden. Then, almost like a dream, the long, thin, clear-cut shadow of a boy near the white roses. Harry! I thought I saw a glimmer of red among the trees, among the roses, like close red curls on a boy's head. Then, there was nothing. The next day, I started on my secret mission. I took a bus to town and went to the big, gaunt building I hadn't visited for over five years. Then, Jim and I had gone together. The top floor of this building belonged to the Greythorn Adoption Society. James, how nice to see you again. How's Christine? My goodness, it must be four years at least. Oh, it's more than five, Miss Cleaver. Well, well, well Chris is very well. Miss Cleaver, I'd better get straight to the point. I, I know you don't normally tell people about a child's origins, not even to the child's adopters, but I I must know who Christine is. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. James, but I will... Please, let me tell you the whole story, and, and, and you'll see I, I'm not just suffering from 
Vulgar curiosity. Yes. All right, then. Uh, please, won't you sit down? Thank you. Miss Cleaver. <clears throat> it's very queer. Very queer indeed, Mrs. James. Look, I'm going to break our rule for once. I'm going to tell you in confidence where Christine came from. Thank you. She was born in a very poor part of London. There were four in the family. Father, mother, son, and Christine herself. Son? Yes. The parents hadn't really wanted Christine. Family lived in one room at the top of a very old house, which would have been condemned by the sanitary inspector, in my opinion. It was difficult enough when there were only three of them. But with a baby as well, life became a nightmare. The mother was a neurotic creature, slatternly, unhappy, too fat. After she had the baby, she took no interest in it. Brother, however, adored the little thing right from the start. He constantly got into trouble for cutting school so that he could look after her. Uh, Christine. Yes? One morning in the small hours, a woman on the ground floor saw something fall past her window. She heard a thud on the ground outside. She went out to look and found the son of the family there, on the ground. Christine was in his arms. The boy's neck was broken. He was dead. The little girl was blue in the face, but still breathing faintly. The woman worked for household, sent for the police and the doctor, and they went to the top room. They had to break the door down because it was locked and sealed inside. The window was open, but there was an overpowering smell of gas. They found the husband and wife, dead in bed. There was a note from the husband. It said, I can't go on. I'm going to kill them all. It's the only way. The police concluded that he'd sealed up the doors and windows, turned on the gas when his family were asleep, and lain down beside his wife until he drifted into unconsciousness and death. But the son must have woken up. Perhaps he struggled with the door, but couldn't open it. He'd been too weak to shout. All he could do was pluck away the seals from the window, open it, and fling himself out, holding his adored little sister tightly in his arm. So her brother saved her life and died himself? Yes. He was a very brave little boy. Perhaps he thought not so much of saving her as keeping her with him. Oh, dear, that, that sounds ungenerous. I... I didn't mean to be Miss Cleaver. What was his name, the brother? Oh, I'll have to look that up for you. I'm glad Christine is well, though. I'd be most grateful if you'd uh, count this information as secret between you and me, Mrs. James. As I said, we've never before... Oh, um... The family's name was... Jones, the 14-year-old brother was Harold. Come, Harry, come too. Goodbye, Harry. I'm sorry you can't come in, but I've got to have my milk. Goodbye, Harry. Goodbye, Harry. What does it all mean? I, I can't understand. It's not easy. But I think deep in her unconscious mind, Christine has always remembered Harry, the companion of her babyhood. We don't think of children as having much memory, but there must be images of the past tucked away somewhere in their little heads. Christine doesn't invent this Harry. She remembers him so clearly that she almost brought him back to life again. May I have the address of the house where they lived, please? The house seemed deserted. It was filthy and derelict. But one thing made me stare and stare. There was a tiny garden. A scatter of bright, uneven grass splashed the bald brown patches of earth. But the little garden had one strange glory. 
that none of the other houses in the poor, sad street possess. A bush of white roses. What are you doing here? Oh, I... I thought the house was empty. Should be. Being condemned. They can't get me out. Nowhere else to go. Won't go. The others went quickly enough after it happened. No one else wants to come. They say the place is haunted. So it is, but what's the fuss about? Life and death, they're very close. You get to know that when you're old, alive or dead, what's the difference? Yes. I saw him fall past the window. What? That's where he fell, among the roses. Oh, he still comes back, I see him. He won't go away till he gets her. Who? Who are you talking about? Harry Jones. Oh, nice boy he was, red hair, very thin. Too determined, though, always got his own way. Loved the little girl too much, I thought. Died among the roses. Used to sit down there with her for hours. Then he died there. Or do people die? Nobody's got any answers. No one nowhere. For you... The day you ain't dead in the city you across the bright, hot pavement, and my legs felt heavy and half paralyzed. I lost all sense of time. Then I heard the clock strike three, and it chilled my blood. At three o'clock, I was supposed to be at the school gate, waiting for Christine. For Christine James. I'm her mother. I'm so sorry I'm late. Where is she? Christine James? Oh, yes, I remember. She's new, with a little red haired girl. That's all right, Mrs. James. Her brother called for her. How alike they are, aren't they? And so devoted. It's rather strange. The futile search continued for months. The papers were full of the strange disappearance of the red-haired child. The teacher described the brother who had called for her. There were stories circulated about kidnapping, baby snatching, child murders. Then the sensation died down. It became just another unsolved mystery in police files. And only two people knew what happened. An old, crazed woman living in a derelict house, and myself. Such ordinary things make me afraid. Sunshine, sharp shadows on grass, white roses, children with red hair, and the name Harry. Such an ordinary name. The 
The program is adapted for broadcasting and produced by Michael McCabe. Accident. Automobile accident. Over. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio